masih. <laughs> Siap, Pak? Alhamdulillah sehat, Pak. Alhamdulillah. Mudah-mudahan Pak Safrudi juga. Ya, sama-sama Alhamdulillah hari ya. ini. Saya sempat ya, dengar tadi Arif, Arif udah join the club of COVID. Um, <laughs> ya, ya. The Fiverr. Aku masih COVID virgin. Oh, Lydia belum pernah ya? Ya. Yeah. Mudah-mudahan stresnya, Bu. Amin, amin. <laughs> Saya mau ke Canberra nanti Agustus September udah beli itu yang mask respirator itu Pak yang pakai filter N95. Oh, oh. No, 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 no. udah udah jauh di atas N95. Kalau N95 sih sehari-hari belajar saya juga N95 Pak. <coughs> yang respirator itu loh yang uh, filternya yang apa sih namanya 100% filter? Saya belum 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 pernah lihat itu. Nah, aku 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 Seperti aku research mana yang mau dibeli aja di dua minggu. Lumayan juga yang datang. Tadi udah lihat Mas Budi nggak tahu di mana Mas Budi? Yeah. Tadi sudah kelihatan. Assalamualaikum Bapak Ibu semua ini uh, istri Profesor Almarhum Hendra Esmara Ibu Rosmi, Rosnita Rostina Rostina Hendra Selamat pagi Bapak Ibu dimanapun berada Pak Yusuf Ansori Pak Safrudin Karimi uh, uh, Profesor Yuri ini Ibu Ibu uh, Rosnita Hendra Salam dari Padang Assalamualaikum Ibu. Assalamualaikum. Sudah lama juga tidak jumpa Ibu nih. Recording in progress. Nah, ini juga Bapak Ibu ada Profesor Dr. Safrizal. Uh, Profesor Dr. Safrizal juga hadir. <tuk> ketutup Budi kamera ke tutup Budi. Nah ini Pak Profesor Safrizal sama Ibu Ros Mita Ros Rostina Rostina uh, Hendra. Ibu ini Pak Dekan. Andalas is an institution as a pioneer in regional economic development in Indonesia. This institution has developed various research, publications, training,
Oke, okay, bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Bapak dan Ibu, kita akan memulai acara kita sesaat lagi. Dan kepada Bapak dan Ibu untuk menempati tempat yang telah disediakan. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. We would like to recognize and welcome to Dean of Faculty of Economic and Business, Dr. F. Ayonedi. We also would like to recognize and welcome to Vice Dean of Faculty of Economic and Business, Bapak Ferry Andrianus, Bapak Andrizal Ridwan, and Dr. Ma'ruf. The Honorable Chairman of the Senate of Faculty of Economic and Business, Bapak Syahril Ali, and also the Honorable the Family of the late uh, Prof. Hendra Esmara. Selamat datang, Ibu dan keluarga pada seminar room pada hari ini. Ladies and gentlemen, we also would like to uh, uh, say welcome to the speaker that has been um, joined with us in the Zoom meeting. There is Associate Professor Yuri Mansuri from Illinois Institute of Technology. Selamat malam kalau di Amerika nih ya Pak ya. Selamat pagi Ibu. Selamat pagi dari Indonesia Bapak. Oke, okay, kemudian juga uh, yang terhormat uh, the Honorable Professor Budi uh, Peroso Sudarmo, selamat pagi Pak Budi from Australian National University and we also would like to recognize Dr. Mia Amalia from Bapenas and the Honorable Prof. Uh, Arif Anshwari Yusuf, President Indonesia Regional Science Association, selamat pagi Bapak. And we also would like to recognize all of the guests that has been joined with us here in the seminar room. Uh, we have the head of Financial Service Authority, West Sumatra, represented by Bapak Mendi Rahmadi. Selamat pagi, Pak Mendi, selaku Deputy Director Pengawasan Lembaga Jasa Keuangan. And we also uh, would like to recognize um, the head of Bank Indonesia will be joined with us soon. And also the Dean of Faculty of Economic and Business, Uh, from Bung Hatta Universitas Negeri Padang and the Honorable Professor in Faculty of Economic and Business Universitas Andalas. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, praises always be given to Allah for the blessing and guidance and do that we can all be here to join this event, the inaugural Hendra Esmanu Lecture on Regional Development. Good morning from Indonesia and welcome to Seminar Room of Faculty of Economic and Business of Universitas Andalas, West Sumatra, Indonesia for the inaugural Hendra Esmara Lecture on Regional Development with the theme uh, Special Pattern on Urban Population Across Indonesian City Insight from Complex System Science. My name is Indah Permata Suryani, will be hosting you during this event. Ladies and gentlemen, the late Professor Hendra Esmara was a pioneer in the analysis of regional development patterns and inequality in Indonesia. In the early 1960s, he saw the need to pay more attention to regional disparities in Indonesia. And in 1967, Prof. Hendra Esmara established the Institute for Regional Economic Research, or in Bahasa we call it Lembaga Penelitian Ekonomi Regional, at Universitas Andalas, and this is recognized as the first institute that focused on regional development in Indonesia. Professor Esmara's pioneering publication in 1971 in the Bulletin of Indonesian Economic Studies 
Um, this is among the first comprehensive papers on regional income disparities in Indonesia. And this is also marked as the birth of regional analysis in the country. And ladies and gentlemen, in addition to uh, the academic work, Professor Esmara served as advisor to numerous Indonesian government agencies, including Statistik Indonesia or Badan Pusat Statistik and also Bapenas. And he actively participated in managing the Indonesian Association for Economists, or we call it Ikatan Sarjana Ekonomi Indonesia, and also support the career of the many junior lecturers. So I, th I think um, I also have a short discussion before with the dean about uh, the story of Professor Henry Asmara, and uh, he also support the many junior economists in academia and also the government. Prof. Henry Asmara also play the role significantly in international organizations, and among other, he was a member of Ex Executive Council for Asian Manpower Studies, the member of Steering Committee for the World Health Organization or uh, Research Program on Socioeconomics of Health in Geneva, and also Deputy Executive Director of the Asia Pacific Economic Corporation. And ladies and gentlemen, in 1985, Henry Esmara was appointed Professor of Regional Planning at Universitas Andalas and also the first professor at the University of Faculty of Economics. So probably we can give an applause, ladies and gentlemen, this morning. And Bapak Henry Esmara also served this position until his passing on 13 of August, 2000. This thing is gas, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before we start, allow me to remind the several points for the participant on the Zoom meeting. Please make sure that all participants in the mute position and turn on your video if possible. Ladies and gentlemen, now we are moving to the first agenda. Um, I would like to um, invite Dr. F. Ionedi to deliver a welcoming speech as the Dean of Faculty of Economic and Business, Universitas Analas. Time is yours, Papa. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. The honorable family of Pak Hendra Esmara, selamat datang Ibu, Bapak dan cucu-cucu ya. Irsa Presiden Profesor Arif Ansor Yusuf, our distinguished speakers, Dr. Yuri Mansuri, Dr. Mia Amalia Profesor Safrudin Kadimi, Profesor Budi Reso Sudarmo, respected guests and participants. Good morning from Indonesia. Selamat malam untuk Pak Yuri di sana. Uh, I am uh, Eva Yonedi, the Dean of Faculty of Economics and Business of Universitas Andalas. Uh, I am super amazed by the energy and then excitement permitting by this faculty, which is reflected by the faculty members, our students, our alumni, staff, and friends I have been working with. Faculty of Economics and Business have been recognized outside Java Island as a symbol of quality producing research and graduating leaders who have an important effect on the government and business world. And Professor Hendra Esmara, one is uh, our first professor who contribute to regional development and science. And it was by this reputation we attract prospective students to come to the University of Andalas, especially Faculty of Economy and Business. And to maintain it, we need to keep up the tradition of intellectual engagement 
innovate and giving more impacts to the government, to the society, and to the business world. The event today is highly relevant and very important to our 2028 vision. And I hope you enjoy it and you take away important insights from our speakers. Our ambition in the Faculty of Economics and Business, Universitas Sandalas, is to improve the quality of education, to increase the productivity of research and publication, in which we are more relevant to the society, to the government, and to the industry. And changes in higher education and shift in our student needs require us to revisit our strategy, our strategic priorities and to evaluate risks and to identify opportunities for innovation. AACSB, an international accreditation board, has identified five forces that will help us to achieve systematic change in response to shifting societal and business needs. The first force, and we need to anticipate that we have to commit to positive societal impact. We will need to think strategically about how we can produce research with impact and develop the knowledge, skills, and behavior that require for future leaders. And secondly, we should embed the principle of diversity, the equity, inclusion, and belonging to our culture and our strategic planning. And thirdly, we need to evaluate the existing partnership that we have and create a new ones to ensure that our faculty is solution-driven and relevant for students and relevant for our users. Fourthly, we need to strategically invest in technologies that serve diversified learner needs and others and address educational demands for the future. And lastly, we need to equip our faculty members for success as our roles expand to meet new expectations in the student experience. So we, in the Faculty of Economy and Business, want to continue making investments in research, in education, people, and programs that necessary to maintain the standard of excellence for which we want to be more recognized regionally and globally. To maintain our high academic standards in this ever-changing environment, we must invest more in teaching, developing case studies, in research and publication, in the new course developments. We are planning to open new study program in economic, in Islamic economics and finance, new study program in entrepreneurship, and a PhD program in accounting. So today, we are really grateful to have Dr. Yuri Mansuri, Dr. Mia Amalia, Professor Safrudin Karimi, Professor Budi Reso uh, Sudarmo, and thank you for your insights you will be giving in this lecture. On behalf of our faculty members, our staff, we would like to thank IRSA for initiating this important lecture. I also want to thank FKP for uh, this for making this event very, very well planned and very well executed. We really appreciate the local organizing committee who has been working very hard to make this event happen today. So thank you, everyone. You did it, and we really appreciate it. Thank you very much, and enjoy the lecture. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
Yeah, by Eva, please remain on the stage. Thank you very much to the Dean of Faculty of, of Economic and Business, Universitas Andalas, Dr. Eva Yonedi. Ladies and gentlemen, now we are moving to the opening speech. We'll deliver by Professor Arif Anshori Yusuf, President Indonesia Regional Science Association that has been joined with us in the Zoom meeting. Pak Arif, dipersilakan, Bapak. Okay, terima kasih. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <coughs> Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, first of all, on behalf of members of Indonesian Regional Science Association, IRSA, and the community of IRSA, I think uh, we would like to uh, thank you uh, for making this event possible. Uh, IRSA is very honored to be able to manage to co-organize the inaugural uh, lecture series in, in the memory of Professor Hendra Esmara. Uh, I think, let me say a few words about uh, Hendra Esmara. I don't know him personally very well, but I think uh, this inaugural, inaugural lecture series will be good for current generations, today's generations of researchers, uh, because uh, they and we all need an inspir uh, people who inspires in how to be uh, true uh, intellectuals. And in Professor Esmara's time, I think Professor es Hendra Esmara himself is quite unique. But I think in my view, if, a, if Professor Hendra Esmara today is still with us, he will also be still a unique figure and only a few um, that has this character. I think for to account, <clears throat> first of all, uh, it is not very many. We have uh, professors who are doing research meticulously in details, uh, in attention to details uh, <clears throat> for, for a senior professors. Uh, Many of us, if you already become senior, you tend to direct things to let other people doing the job. Yeah. But I think the details is what matters. So I think Professor Henry Esmaras uh, show us that uh, if you have patience in research in such complex uh, discipline like regional science, then you have to do, uh, you have to understand the whole uh, steps of research. Uh, you can show examples like that. And it's quite not many in Indonesia, I think, even today. Uh, secondly, I think the more, the more important part is uh, Professor Hendra Esmara has been very consistent in the role of advising, not necessarily executing policies, because many of us are tempted to be executors of policy, but we have to remember that we don't really lack of executor in policy. We do lack intellectuals in Indonesia, it's true intellectual. There are many people who want to be executor of policies, but not many want to stay in academic and becoming advisor. So along his career, I read that Prof. Henry Esmara has been consistent in that direction, in that line. So, 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 so to that, to account, I think even to today's standard, uh, the role of Professor Hendra Esmara is not really followed by many people. So, so, so the inaugural lecture series here will be a very important regular event that remind all of us how to become a true intellectual. So, so, so this, I think, uh, my few words about uh, Prof. Henry Esmara. Uh, and I think lastly, I would like to uh, thank everyone who finally managed to have this lecture series. Uh, I cannot mention everyone, but of course, the initiator, Prof. Budi, and then the whole faculty economics at Andalas University uh, and 
especially today's first uh, speakers of the speaker of the first uh, series, uh, Mas Yudi Tenia, eh? uh, who uh, managed to come uh, to attend, uh, either from uh, Zoom in the US or even Mia who can manage, can manage to come uh, to Padang. So I think that's from us, uh, from Isa. Thank you very much. And let's enjoy this first uh, economic lecture series. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Terima kasih Bapak Arief sudah membuka acara kita pada pagi hari ini Ladies and gentlemen, now we are moving to the next agenda Is um, This is probably about the story of Hendra The late of Pak Hendra Esmara and his contribution On the study of regional development Indonesia Will be delivered by Professor Budi P. Reso Sudarmo from Australian National University. Kepada Bapak, dipersilahkan, Bapak. Uh, good morning, friends and colleagues. Um, first of all, thank you for uh, coming uh, to this uh, seminar. So my job is uh, as uh, an outsider um, trying to describe uh, who is uh, the late Professor Hendra Esmara uh, in our opinion. So what I'm going to present is uh, a bit of work that uh, Pro Professor Yuri and I uh, did in the last uh, several months. Uh, trying to understand who are uh, Professor and Esmera. So the initial uh, idea from my side, uh, I received, uh, I, I have a discussion with the, professor, uh, the president of IRSA and Professor Arif uh, asked me to search on the history of regional science in Indonesia. While uh, Professor Yuri receive an assignment from Regional Science uh, International to also uh, uh, learn more about uh, the development of regional science in Indonesia. So I and Professor Yuri communicate and we start our work uh, looking at individuals uh, who are working in regional science. And after discussing and consulting with uh, quite many of people, including some of the uh, prominent economists uh, in Indonesia, uh, 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 Yuri and I conclude that um, uh, one of the uh, pioneers or the pioneers of regional uh, development analysis in Indonesia is uh, the late Professor Hendra Esmara. And uh, this is uh, our, the way that we look at at him. Uh, I have a slide. Can I, uh, can you show me my, the slide? I sent it to uh, Pak Ari last night. Uh, Oke, okay, kita menunggu sebentar, Bapak dan Ibu. So um, first of all, uh, I would uh, shortly discuss the uh, uh, career path of uh, mm -hmm. uh, Hendra Esmara. Um, 
He's born in 1935. Uh, moved to Jakarta uh, to join the, yes, thank you. Um, view, A click view, yeah, and full screen. Full screen, there is a control L. Going down, yes, no, yeah. Yeah, all right, next. Uh, next, yeah, okay, so uh, he, he moved, I think he moved in to Jakarta about 1955, 1957 to join the Faculty of Economics at University of Indonesia and graduated from the Faculty of uh, University of Indonesia in 1961, uh, part of the group that is prepared by uh, Professor Sumitro Joyo Hadi Kusumo uh, to develop a faculty of economics throughout Indonesia. So there is uh, a group of uh, students that recruit by uh, Professor Joyo jo, uh, Hadi Kusumo, Sumitro Joyo Hadi Kusumo, to develop uh, faculty of economics. And the first assignment of Pa Hendra is to uh, Jambi. He lead the faculty of economic in Jambi before in 1967 moved to uh, Andalas and founded uh, the Lembaga Penelitian Ekonomi Regional, which is uh, the first uh, Lembaga Research Research Center on this subject in Indonesia. Uh, it, yeah. uh, and then he received uh, a professorship in 1985 at the age of 50. So that is actually relatively uh, young. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, Professor Henda Espara um, passed away in about in 2000. So this is a short history of uh, Professor, the late Professor Henda Espara, uh, which is his connection with uh, Pa Sumitro group is important uh, uh, for his career. Next, uh, next. Now, I would like to discuss about uh, the connection between him and regional science community international, which is actually very important because this is the beginning of uh, uh, regional science or regional development analysis in Indonesia. In 1971, uh, the late Professor Henry Smara uh, was uh, invited to join the Parfin Fellow Program at Woodruff uh, Public Policies in Princeton. This Parfin Fellows is uh, a prestigious, uh, very prestigious uh, uh, scholarship. Uh, you need to be something uh, to get this uh, scholarship. Yeah? Uh, to visit the Princeton uh, University and Woodruff uh, School of Public Policy, is where John Stiglitz, you know, for a long time staying over there. Angus didn't teach econometric. Uh, it is a prestigious uh, place. He got a fellow for, for a year uh, in the fall of 1971 and spring 1972. Uh, the second semester, because he won't like to uh, learn about regional science or the technique that is needed uh, to analyze regional development, he asked the permission to take courses in uh, University of Pennsylvania uh, Department of Regional Science, which, is, which was funded by uh, Walter Eisert. Walter Eisert himself is the founder of regional science. Now, so in UPenn, he took Walter Eisert uh, classes and also Ronald Miller and John Parr. These three are, are uh, important uh, figures in uh, re development of regional science. Now, one important thing is that during this second uh, semester, he developed a paper uh, to, uh, with consultation with, uh, with Professor Walter e Eisert on uh, a topic of macroeconomic model for West Sumatra. Yeah. And uh, during this consultation with Walter, uh, Walter learned about the uniqueness of Indonesia, in which Walter think that regional science 
it could be the method that could groom in Indonesia because of our uh, diversity. So the communication between um, Walter and uh, Professor Hendra Esmara introduced Indonesian uniqueness to the global regional science uh, community. So Walter is so interested with uh, Hendra Esmara in such that he kept that paper yeah, that uh, Pa Hendra wrote at that time in his office. So there is a, a, a box called Hendra Esmara with the hope that uh, Pa Hendra Esmara will come back uh, to uh, UPenn to do his dissertation. Although that was uh, not happening, but the interests on Indonesia are introduced. And he also participated in uh, one of the earliest regional science uh, conference, which, which was in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, also introducing the issue of uh, regional development, and particularly regional inequality in Indonesia. So community, regional science community international, aware of the uniqueness of Indonesia issue in terms of uh, diversity on regional development. Um, knowing that Pa Hendra wouldn't come, and then uh, Walter decided to uh, accept uh, people that recommended by uh, uh, Pa Hendra to come to uh, University of Pennsylvania, which is Professor uh, Safrijal and, and Professor Ali Basha Amin. So, yeah, they both are uh, formerly uh, Indonesian that learn regional science. And at the time, the top school on regional science around the world are in UPenn and in Cornell. Several years later on, uh, uh, Kaminsky, together with Walter, uh, accepted Iwan J. Aziz to study regional science. So these are the, the, the first three that formally learn uh, the knowledge of uh, regional science from the founder. And they, uh, they then have students and so on, and uh, uh, start all the activities in regional science until we got IRSA and uh, our annual uh, conference. So that, that is an important uh, connection uh, that I think uh, need to be mentioned. Next. And if you look at uh, Professor Andres Mara, one thing that uh, Professor Yuri and I um, conclude that this person is the person that pioneers is look at his uh, publication in 1970s. Uh, not many Indonesian, almost uh, I, I don't know and uh, I cannot find, in 1970s has uh, three articles in international journal. Uh, if you think that uh, those who part of the group that go to Berkeley are famous economics, but they don't produce uh, three article at international journal within five years. So uh, this reputation at that time was uh, an achievement that um, difficult to compete. And even for several years, it's difficult to compete. And more importantly, Pa Hendra Esmara is not somebody that is teaching in University of Indonesia or teaching in Gajah Mada University, which is the big university in Indonesia. He is uh, located in Andalas University. Uh, so that is, uh, for us, is amazing. And one of the article that was published in 1975 is a well-cited article because that is one of the first article that described the regional income inequality in Indonesia. So the literature on regional income inequality in Indonesia uh, for many people uh, started from this 1975 article in the Bulletin of Indonesian Economic Studies. Uh, and so, uh, uh, after discussing with a lot of people, we conclude that uh, Pahendra is um, 
uh, the pioneer that start all these activities and analysis on uh, regional development and regional inequality uh, in Indonesia. Uh, even uh, later on, the academic uh, later on uh, using this article as the beginning of uh, uh, start to understand why regional inequality is happening. Mas Iwan, Professor Iwan, uh, dissertation in Cornell is developing a theory why regional inequality happen uh, through uh, capital investment, capital mobility. So, so the, the meeting with Walter is important because then Walter uh, uh, basically uh, argued to his colleague that this Indonesia is a case that we need to look. And even when we, he uh, gets past Iwan, he actually uh, uh, encouraged Mas Iwan to develop a theory on understanding uh, regional uh, diversity or regional inequality. Uh, so uh, next. So what we conclude, there are five contribution that uh, Professor Andre and Smara make throughout his career. First is that in 1970s, while most economists are talking about how Indonesia could recover after the 1965-67 uh, cases, um, the only person uh, that argue at national level about the need to have regional equality uh, is the late Professor Andra Esmara through his article in Eki, through his article in the bulletin, uh, basically saying that, yes, we need to, as a country, need to uh, develop, but we need to also resolve regional inequality at the same time. Now that is uh, important, and, and, and again, it, was, it is the one, that con uh, the one that arguing that at a national level and also attracted international attention is somebody that from uh, university outside Java. So he became a representative of academic outside Java on the importance of regional inequality. Now, and then he established the center, yes, um, a unique center that basically look at uh, regional development uh, in the country and um, being able to create a network uh, between that center and the economics in uh, Jakarta. That is why he is active also in ASI, uh, becoming part of uh, Sumitro Joy Harisukusomo group, but also have a connection with uh, Walter and the other people uh, in uh, the US. Uh, and also, second, he make a contribution in establishing regional GDP. Um, uh, then his article uh, basically uh, acknowledged uh, or being noticed as the birth of uh, regional science or regional economic uh, development in Indonesia. And um, uh, finally, he also, after that, he de uh, developed more career to uh, uh, to work together with the governor of West uh, Sumatra in developing West Sumatra, which is the style that actually uh, uh, mimic by other uh, academic in uh, regional university. So that that five uh, contribution is uh, significant uh, for, for uh, according to us from outside. Uh, next, so this is why. Irsa uh, is happy to collaborate with the Faculty of Economics uh, and Business at University of Andalas uh, to conduct this uh, Hendra X Mara lecture on regional development, maybe be uh, twice, once every two years, uh, particularly with the following objective uh, to celebrate uh, the pioneering work of the late Professor Hendra X Mara in the field of regional development in Indonesia uh, to enhance the science of regional development uh, analysis in Indonesia 
and to stimulate uh, younger academic, particularly those at of Java uh, academic institution, to strengthen their contribution in the field of regional development. They got an example that uh, the late Professor Nick Aismara could uh, contribute nationally and internationally on this subject. And so the younger generation should, could also uh, achieve this reputation. And uh, uh, finally, we would like to support the development of academic environment and culture at academic institution in Indonesia. So this seminar hopefully stimulate this uh, uh, academic environment and academic culture uh, within academic institution in, in, in Indonesia. So uh, uh, IRSA uh, again is happy uh, and would like to thank the Faculty of Economics and Business uh, University of Andalas uh, for, uh, their for your contribution in pioneering uh, the science of regional development in Indonesia. So um, for us, uh, that is your significant contribution as an institution um, uh, starting, start this, all these activities in uh, regional development analysis. So, but, and certainly uh, IRSA hope that University of Andalas is uh, willing or got incentive to keep your reputation to uh, as the pioneer in uh, regional development analysis. You have done it before and in the future you could if you want to be the pioneers or to be the frontier on science of uh, regional development. That is uh, a history that you have made uh, as an outsider, we acknowledge, and from insider, it is up to you what you're going uh, to do. So that is from me as a representative of Indonesia Regional Science Association and as a representative of Regional Science Association International. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Budi. So please remain on the stage, uh, Bapak. Ladies and gentlemen, so that was a short uh, story. I think it's pr probably can be longer, yeah, but <laughs> the, we, we, we try to arrange it in, in a very short. And we can show that the contribution of Almarhum uh, Bapak Hendra Esma was really huge to the community also. All right, ladies and gentlemen, now we are moving to the next agenda. Um, we have a special agenda from Prof. Safrizal will uh, deliver a gift to Professor Budi. Yeah, before Pak Safrizal, Bang Ari, mohon dibantu, Bang. Buku, ya, yeah. uh, menyerahkan kenang-kenangan ya, Bapak dari Pak Safrizal kepada Prof. Budi dan mungkin sekaligus setelah ini kita langsung foto bersama dulu izin Pak Dekan dengan ya yeah, dengan uh, dari Isa dan juga para tamu dan undangan kita yang sudah bergabung pagi ini. Dipersilakan, Bapak. Okay, uh, I'd like to express my highly appreciation to Pak Budi and very, and also thanks because he was the one who promote Professor Indrasmara as a pioneer of the regional economic analysis. Actually, I should have done this one because I am a student and I'm also assistant to the Lembaga Penelitian Ekonomi Regional and also, also research, research uh, staff. But if I did it, maybe nobody will, and <laughs> will be believe yeah. Nobody will believe yeah, because, yeah. but if Professor uh, Budi who expressed that, I believe word will be believed. 
all, all over the world we believe that because oh. he's from uh, famous uh, from the famous university in Australia, the best university in Australia, Australian National University. He's a professor now. So if the professor expressed that Professor Endasmara is really the pioneer for Indonesia in regional economic analysis, I think everybody will believe that. <laughs> if I did it, maybe nobody will believe that. <laughs> yeah, 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 Pak Yuri. Okay, okay uh, then in this occasion, I like also to uh, give this as a, maybe as a, To remind uh, our relation because I already met Pak Budi. So I have uh, wrote this book on regional economics, but this is Indonesian, not in English. <laughs> That's why it is only for con consumption of the Indonesian people. But I give it because you are also Indonesian, right? <laughs> and the other one, there is uh, analysis of economic, urban economic analysis. Yeah. This is also one of part of the uh, regional economic analysis. I also wrote this one and also give it to you. Yeah, thank you. So, so uh, thank you for everybody and uh, thank you to Pak Budi. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Pak uh, Professor Chef Rizal, thank you very much on behalf of Indonesia Regional Science Association. And on behalf of Regional Science Association International, uh, we really appreciate that you come over here and providing this uh, book to us. Thank you, Pak. Terima kasih kepada Prof. Rizal dan juga uh, Prof. Budi. Uh, izin kita melakukan foto bersama terlebih dahulu sebelum kita memulai sesi diskusi. Bagaimana, Pak Dekan? Bagaimana, Bang Ari? Komite? Ya, yeah, alright. So. Kami persilakan kepada para undangan Bapak uh, untuk Ibu Ibu memungkinkan enggak ya? Bisa duduk ya Bu ya. Apakah memungkinkan Bu? Oke Bapak Medi silakan Bapak. Ya Kak Ida mohon dibantu. Duduk duduk. Bapak Wakil Dekan, silakan Pak Bapak Saril, Pak Basaril, Bapak Wakil Dekan, Pak N, Pak Ferry, Pak Maruf, silakan Bapak. Bapak dan Ibu yang di Zoom meeting nanti kita foto bersama juga ya Pak. Ya baik, terima kasih Bapak dan Ibu. Baiklah Bapak dan Ibu, ladies and gentlemen, now we are moving to the next agenda. So the next agenda is a video of relaunch of Lembaga Penelitian Ekonomi Regional at Universitas Andalas. Kami persilahkan. Mari kita saksikan bersama sebentar lagi akan diputar video relaunch Lembaga Penelitian. Senior 
Institute, the Institute for Regional Economic Research at the Faculty of Economics and Business, Universitas Andalas, is an institute as a pioneer in regional economic development in Indonesia. This institution has developed various research, publications, training, workshops, and community development at the local, national, and international levels. For almost 60 years, the Institute for Regional Economic Research at the Faculty of Economics and Business, Universitas Andalas, is an institution as a pioneer in regional economic development in Indonesia. This institution has developed various research, publications, trainings, workshops, and community development at the local, national, and international levels. Dalam usia yang 65 tahun, siswa usia tinggi dan bagi mahasiswa bagi pemuda ini merupakan media media data masuk ke dalam negara penelitian bagi dosen. Lembaga penelitian ini merupakan tempat juga mereka di dalam. Di bidang lembaga ini pernah ikut dalam sebagai bagian dari kegiatan penelitian regional di IBRD Nagoya. Di samping itu, lembaga pemerintah internasional juga aktif dalam usut umpan pemerintah daerah dalam usut uh, rencana pembangunan daerah dalam pemerintah daerah. Saya ingat pada tahun 1974, itu saya baru masuk di Fakultas Ekonomi Universitas Andalas, Profesor Hendra Esmara, mengundang uh, Profesor Han ya, dari Australian National University memberikan kuliah umum ke kita yang dilakukan di Aula Fakultas Ekonomi yang masih ada sampai sekarang itu, yang bergonjong itu. Beliau menjelaskan kondisi ekonomi Indonesia ketika itu pada kita dalam bahasa Inggris. Saya pertama sekali belajar bagaimana mengukur ya indeks Gini itu pernah menjadi asisten peneliti di lembaga penelitian ekonomi regional. Saya juga ketika itu terlibat ikut menghitung-hitung produk domestik regional bruto karena sepengetahuan saya itu adalah Prof Hendra yang menjadi perintisnya untuk Indonesia. Dan dimulai pengerjaannya itu di Lembaga Penelitian Ekonomi Regional. Menurut saya adalah, kalau EPR mau berkembang ke depan, tentu dia harus lebih dari reputasi yang telah disampai, yang telah dicapai sebelum ini. Nah, kalau Pak Endra ini sudah bisa memperkenalkan internasional LPR ini paling tidak pimpinan sekarang tetap bisa mempertahankan LPR itu mempunyai reputasi nasional dan internasional dengan cara-cara yang lebih komprehensif dan melibatkan seluruh dosen-dosen yang seperti yang dilakukan oleh Bapak Indra Esmara selama ini.
penelitian ekonomi tidak bisa lagi ritmiknya sama dengan masa lalu. Penelitian ekonomi hari ini sudah pasti dikaitkan dengan digitalisasi, internet of thing, dan dikaitkan dengan metodologi-metodologi yang sophisticated, tetapi gampang dimengerti untuk kepentingan, terutama sekali analisa ekonomi internasional dan nasional. Sekurang-kurangnya lembaga penelitian ekonomi regional hari ini uh, berperan di negara-negara uh, kawasan Asian. Ya. Uh, kalau kita perhatikan, kalau saya melihat ya, Asian ini sebenarnya kan uh, Indonesia uh, boleh kita katakan sebagai negara uh, pendiri Asian, kemudian sebagai negara yang uh, diperhitungkan sangat oleh dunia di dalam konteks negara-negara Asian. Ada anti-GT-nya, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapura Gross Triangle dan macam-macam semuanya itu uh, dan juga universitas-universitas uh, di Asia sekarang mulai bertumbuh dan saya melihat LPR uh, harus mengambil peluang ini harapan kita kepada LPR Fakultas Ekonomi dan Bisnis uh, Universitas Anda dewasa ini ada terus melakukan uh, Peluasan-peluasan kerjasama bagi dunia industri, kemudian dengan universitas baik level nasional maupun internasional, dan juga dengan pemerintah, baik itu pemerintah lokal dan juga pemerintah pusat Republik Indonesia. Hal ini diperlukan karena mencermati perubahan-perubahan dari kondisi ekonomi yang terjadi, yang sangat cepat, disebabkan oleh terjadinya revolusi industri for jadi tuntutan-tuntutan kepada LPR itu sangat perlu untuk mengembangkan diri tersebut baik itu dalam skala riset, uh, training, workshop, seminar internasional seminar dan segala macamnya nah, karena kita secara histori itu cukup mumpuni dan juga tanpa meninggalkan legasi masyarakat Institute for Regional Economic Research, Faculty of Economics and Business, Universitas Andalas, untuk kejayaan bangsa. Sarjana Ekonomi Indonesia and also Islamic Economic Forum for Indonesia. Um, Ibu Adila also been uh, doing several research experience uh, related to um, resilience of sektor usaha di Sumatera Barat about kajian komoditi produk jenis usaha unggulan provinsi Sumatera Barat and also have been uh, gained a professional training from sertifikasi Nazir Wakaf and also big data analytics. So now I would like to invite Bu Adila Adisti as our moderator today. Okay, thank you, Indah. Uh, <coughs> good morning, everybody. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. <coughs> First of all, uh, Honorable Deans, uh, Faculty of Economic, Dr. Eva Yonedi, uh, Honorable Speaker and Discussions, uh, Distinguished Guests, and Ladies and Gentlemen. First of all, I would like to welcome all of you to the inaugural Hendra Esmara Lecture on Regional Development. Okay, we, we now have the presentations. Uh, before we start the presentation, 
allow us to uh, introduce the, present, the presenters, Associate Professor Yuri Mansuri from Illinois Institute of Technology. Hello, Prof. It's already uh, on the screen. I'm here. Okay, how are you, Prof? I'm good, thank you. Okay, thank you. you. Thank you for joining us. Okay, uh, Professor, Associate Professor Yuri Mansuri is a trained as regional science, currently teach uh, an urban planning analysis. His current area of research are the economic technology and innovations, computational uh, modeling urban systems, spatial network, disaster impact analysis, and unbalanced regional development. He has an author and co-author the peer review article published in variety social journals, uh, including a computer, environment, urban system, journal of economics, dynamic control, and regional science and practice. Professor Associate, Associate Professor Yuri Mansuri had the postdoctoral fellowship from the Harvard University and Massachusetts Institute of Technology and received his PhD from the Cornell University. Okay, uh, his research uh, interests related to urban regional studies, economic development, technology and society, and the method of planning analysis. Okay, uh, I would like to have two discussions today. Professor Safrudin Karimi from Faculty of Economics, Universitas Andal. Hello, Prof. How are you? Prof, you can hear me? Yeah, good morning. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we're glad to see you here today in uh, this occasion. Uh, professor Safrudin Karimi, if one professor from uh, Universitas Andalas, he completed his uh, PhD from Florida State University and Master of Art in University of Philippines. Okay, his experience as a Dean Faculty of Economics and Director of Graduate School of UNAN. His research interests related to international economics, political economics, macroeconomics, and economic influentiary research elements. Okay, I would like to uh, welcome our uh, last speaker, Dr. Mia Amalia from the National Development Planning Agency. Please, Dr. Mia Amalia, uh, you can come to the state. Okay, uh, Dr. Am uh, Mia Amalia um, completed her doctoral from the nation at Australian National University. Uh, in the Master Science Environmental Science in Universitas Indonesia. Her research interests related to the choice modeling, economics, uh, environmental economics, and environmental impact uh, assessment. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Mia, for joining us. I had uh, you come since yesterday. Okay, uh, thank you for uh, coming, all of the speaker and discussions. <clears throat> Okay, for, without further ado, I would like to uh, welcome our beloved presenter, Associate Professor Yuri Mansuri, with the topic is the special pattern of urban population across Indonesian city, insight from the complex system science. All right, uh, Dr. Ma Yuri Mansuri, uh, time is yours. Thank you for the introduction, Adila. Can everyone see my presentation? Yes. Great, thank you. It's a great honor to be invited to uh, the inaugural lecture um, in honor of uh, Professor Hendra Ismara on regional development. I wanna first thank uh, the uh, Faculty of Economics, um, Universitas Andalas, in particular, the Dean, Dr. F. I. Onedi, the Indonesian Regional Science Association, in particular, uh, the president, uh, Professor Arif Ansar Yusuf, um, and of course, my Cornell senior, Professor Budira Sasudarmo, without whom this lecture would not have been possible. Um, 
And uh, of course, uh, my discussions, uh, Professor Safudin Karimi and Dr. Mia Amelia for taking the time today uh, to discuss my presentation. I'm looking forward to a very fruitful conversation about the topic of uh, um, spatial inequality across Indonesian cities. I want to first make sure that I acknowledge the help of my junior colleague, really, my um, former master's student at the Korea Development Institute, uh, Mr. Ahmad Adipurawan, um, who is now at SACNEC, uh, the Minister of State, Secretariat of the uh, Republic of Indonesia, um, who has helped me, not just in terms of uh, data collection, but also identifying the research questions and some of the topics that I am going to talk about today. Let me begin my presentation by a couple of uh, descriptive statistics. Um, <clears throat> so the, the largest uh, city in Indonesia, as we all know, is Jakarta. It's a population of about 10 and a half million. And uh, the, the second largest city is Surabaya. Uh, so that's a population of about um, 3.9 million people. Um, and if we compute the ratio of a Jakarta population to Surabaya population, we'll come with a number of about four. That is to say the population of Jakarta is about four times the population of Surabaya. So we'll come to, uh, in the next slide, you know, um, why that is a, a big deal. Uh, but just, just what, um, one more piece of uh, statistic here. Uh, the smallest Indonesian city, Sabang, is home to about 40,000 Indonesians. To calculate what, what is uh, the ratio of a Sabang population to Jakarta's population, that's about four thousands or 0.4% or of Jakarta population. Um, so Professor Hendra S. Mar is a very passionate about addressing regional disparities. Uh, so here we're not really talking about economic disparities you know, um, or GDP, although we'll talk about the connection between population inequality and economic inequality. But this is a different kind of a regional disparities. Here we're talking about the concentration of population in certain cities, in particular, the largest Indonesian cities. So why is that factor of four you know, a big deal? The, the
and live in uh, in cities and that's a pattern that's going to uh, continue uh, for the foreseeable future so just uh, uh, zooming in a little bit more, in uh, digging, bit digging, more digging deeper digging, digging deeper uh, into uh, the numbers here um, and looking at the uh, 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 population growth rate. Okay, um, in Indonesia uh, right now is not the fastest growing country anymore in terms of a population. So we should uh, tip our head off, you know, to. Uh, Kabik or Gabriel China programs have been highly successful in managing population uh, growth in Indonesia. So we have average population growth of about 2.8%, not the highest in ASEAN. Um, but, you know, we look at the uh, uh, comparison across other ASEAN countries, you know, um, maybe surprisingly uh, to me, uh, you know, when we, we're still higher uh, than um, so it's certainly higher than Singapore, uh, but maybe also, you know, um, somewhat surprisingly, uh, we have a higher population growth than, uh, let's say, the, the Philippines. Okay, but um, certainly <laughs> growth has slowed down. Slow down. down. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, there, there is a... Uh, Or Gabriel China. So, wh why is it important to talk about a population and how population is distributed across uh, um, metropolitan areas or, ci or, or cities? There, there is this uh, paper that is uh, written by a number of uh, very prominent economists. You know, um, at Glazer is still at Harvard. Uh, Jose Sangman is an economist at the University of Chicago, and Andrew Slifer, um, I believe, is uh, uh, still at uh, Chicago as well. And what they argued in this uh, 1995 paper uh, in the Journal of Monetary Economics is that <clears throat> if you look at cities, then the right measure of a city growth should be the growth of population, okay, not GDP growth. Um, not the growth of uh, skilled workers or anything like that, but it's the growth of population because it is a measure of how successful cities are in attracting population you know, from other areas, you know, perhaps from uh, uh, the rural hinterland, but also from other cities to the, you know, to, uh, uh, to the focus city. Okay? So um, they said, across cities, population growth captures the extent to which cities are becoming increasingly attractive habitats and labor markets, right? It's a measure of a success, okay? So they went on to say that cities with good characteristics, such as low manufacturing exposure in the US, um, higher manufacturing is um, considered to be synonymous, you know, to the old economy, okay? So in the new economy, right, uh, people want to have a less exposure you know, to manufacturing and more to the high-end services, you know, um, more to uh, the uh, uh, more innovative uh, uh, industries and so on, um, as well as the high education uh, and low unemployment. There's a typo here, low unemployment. You know, um, these are the cities that grow faster on average, okay? Now, um, importantly, um, in, in the U.S., uh, at least, uh, there is little evidence that bigger cities have a lower population growth. So apparently, you know, um, among American cities, there, there is no evidence there is a convergence uh, in terms of a population, okay? Um, big cities like uh, New York, uh, Los Angeles, Chicago, where I live right now, you know, um, continue to uh, grow and um, at, at least uh, grow as fast as other medium and smaller cities um, in North America. As we will see, this is a different dynamic so, from the ones experiencing um, in, uh, in Indonesia, at least according to, uh, uh, to the data. Okay. Uh, so if, if we unpack the data a, a little bit you know, um, by decade and uh, look at the, uh, the desegregation 
um, uh, between uh, urban, uh, here uh, it is uh, uh, disaggregating urban from the rest of our population. Um, and, and look at the dis uh, disaggregation between uh, Java and the outer islands, so essentially the rest of Indonesia. Um, uh, pretty much uh, the share of urban population um, in Java is a pretty stable um, across uh, four decades here. You know, um, in the decade, decade of the 1980s, uh, the share of urban population who live in Java, that's about 70%, okay? Um, uh, 30 years later, in 2010, look at the share of urban population who live in Java, that percentage you know, um, is still about the same number. Uh, it has decreased a little bit uh, to about 68%, but um, that breakdown between uh, urban population in Java and urban population in the rest of Indonesia, so sort of a, um, you know, um, a stable um, and uh, looks like uh, in, a, in a, um, a sort of a, a long run equilibrium. Now, where, what is the difference here is in terms of uh, urban population growth, okay? Uh, look at the uh, comparison, comparison um, in 1990s, for example, urban population growth in Java, that's a uh, 5.28%. Whereas in outer islands, that's a uh, 5.95%, that's about 6%, so that's higher in rural areas. Uh, but if you look at uh, 2010s, right, at the bottom, the last row here, uh, the urban population growth in Java, that's about 4%, okay? Um, that's a reflection of a slower population growth you know, um, in, the, in the whole country, but still, uh, the rest of Indonesia, in particular, the outer islands, are, are experiencing um, significantly faster growth at the rate of a 4.5 percent. Okay, uh, so you know, um, if this pattern continues, what we'll see is, uh, you know, um, uh, perhaps uh, the uh, you know, change in the balance, right, in terms of our urban population, where. Uh, the proportion of urban population and the outer population is going to keep increasing, okay, um, in relative terms uh, compared to urban population in Java. Okay. It's moving my. Uh, <clears throat> interesting. Uh, Descriptive uh, statistics here, uh, the, the uh, millionaire club um, is associated with the cities with at least uh, 1 million people. Okay, so um, in, uh, um, in, in 2005, there are only 10 millionaire cities. Okay, um, that, that list has since grown uh, to 14 in 2020. Um, you know, um, so uh, we didn't have the data uh, for Tangerang Selatan, South Tangerang, you know, um, it was probably a member of the Millionaire Club uh, even in 2005, but uh, South Tangerang didn't actually become incorporated officially, didn't become a city until uh, after 2005. So that's when the statistics started to become available. Okay, um, um, and uh, an interesting statistic, you know, um, Padang where. Uh, Universitas Andalas is, is uh, one of the uh, upcoming cities in terms of population. So if it, it, the pattern of it continues, you know, um, in the next census, you know, 2030, it's very likely that Padang is going to join uh, the Millionaire Club with a population of at least uh, 1 million people. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Here's a list of the 10 fastest growth cities. Um, uh, between 2005 and 2020. And uh, really, that there is uh, no clear pattern of a relationship uh, between GDP per capita and gross rate of a population. Uh, if anything, it's a little bit all over the map here. Um, what stands out from this list is that uh, the fastest growing cities in Indonesia, right? Um, nine out of 10 are outside of Java. Okay, um, Depok is uh, the only exception, you know, um, probably I'm just uh, hypothesizing here because of uh, the, the presence of UI, 
University of Indonesia, but otherwise, you know, um, the, the, uh, um, where the actions are, right, um, mostly occur outside of, uh, outside of Java. If you look at the 10 slowest growth of cities, you know, I'm in the same period between 2005 and 2020, um, there are some cities uh, experiencing negative growth, you know, Jogja, um, you know, um, I'm not really familiar with uh, Jogja Karta, uh, probably out migration, you know, to other parts uh, in, in, in Java, okay? Uh, again, you know, um, there is no clear pattern here. So we think about uh, um, the uh, convergence hypothesis, you know, there is no evidence just from a casual observation that uh, the largest cities, right, Jakarta, Surabaya, you know, um, uh, Medan and so on, are the ones who are exp experiencing the slowest growth. There's no evidence like that um, uh, of a negative relationship between initial size and subsequent uh, growth of the population. Professor Tommy Firman um, has done a lot of studies on Indonesian cities and um, is a I think the leading Indonesian scholars here, um, he's a professor of uh, regional and city planning at ITB, um, and uh, he has written quite a few uh, influential papers that are recognized uh, not just in, in Indonesia, but also um, you know, um, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in the rest of the world. Uh, here is a one, publica one publication that was uh, uh, published in 2004 where Professor Firman concluded that urbanization in Indonesia remained concentrated um, in a few large cities, you know, in particular Jakarta metropolitan area. So if you combine Jakarta with a Depok and Tangerang um, and Bekasi, um, uh, that's where the action is in terms of the concentration of the population. Um, he said that there is a, some evidence of a convergence even though uh, you know, um, I, I don't really see it, just uh, looking at the data. Uh, but it, it is true um, uh, that the largest in, in Indonesian cities then, in, um, including Jakarta, Surabaya, Bandung, Medan, and Semarang, grew more slowly than the rest of the country. Um, and at the same time, uh, Professor Firman um, also observed that population growth in small and mid-sized cities you know, um, occurred much faster outside of a job in the rest of Indonesia, right, in the outer islands. So um, uh, there is uh, some convergence, but that correlation between initial population and the subse subsequent growth, growth of the urban population, you know, um, I, I don't think is a, is a very strong one. Okay, um, th th there is a very interesting notion of the population uh, growth dynamics in, in Indonesia. This is a uh, you know, um, very different perhaps uh, from the Western world or even from Japan or South Korea where urban population growth is typically accompanied by uh, the reduction uh, in the importance of agriculture relative to um, you know, manufacturing and other sectors. Um, in Indonesia and other Asian cities, uh, there is a phenomenon associated with a Desa Kota region. It's a basically um, the continuing coexistence of agriculture and other industries. You know, um, as uh, cities continue to grow, they continue to coexist. Okay, so it is not the case uh, in in or at least in, in many Indonesian cities. Um, as well as other Asian cities like uh, Bangkok, for example, that uh, the uh, influence of uh, agriculture has uh, diminished. If, if anything, I will show you some numbers that show uh, the uh, contribution of agriculture actually has increased a little bit, okay? Um, so, you know, um, this is a very different from uh, uh, urban population or, or, or urban dynamics uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, in the more developed uh, parts of the world. Uh, <clears throat> So if there's different ways to slice the data, if we look at the uh, uh, employment breakdown across the sectors here, uh, of course, you know, um, agriculture is the dominant um, sector um, in rural areas. Uh, in urban areas, uh, this is uh, for um, 2000, um, you know, 14% um, of GDP 
was accounted for by industries like uh, manufacturing, okay? Um, services uh, figured prominently, right? Um, in urban areas uh, contributed to uh, about 55%. Uh, that was in, in, uh, uh, in 2000. So one would expect, right, um, that 20 years later, if you look at the data for 2020, um, uh, the um, share of agriculture you know, would continue to diminish and the share for manufacturing or industries will continue to increase. But that is not what the data tells us. This is uh, quite interesting here. N now I have uh, a different um, aggregation scheme than uh, what Professor Friedman uses uh, in his paper. Uh, so um, uh, in, uh, um, in, in my aggregation scheme, now this is based on uh, data from uh, Statistics Indonesia or BPS, if you combine the first two rows here for rice farming, and if you also include um, activities like plantation you know, and forestry as agriculture, okay? So what's the total you know, um, for urban areas? That, that's about 13%. What's the total for rural areas? You know, well, that's just 45% um, plus 19%. Uh, what is that, right? Um, uh, uh, that's uh, about 65%, right, um, give and take. So um, what it tells us is that uh, the role or the, the share of agriculture in terms of uh, um, employment, you know, um, actually not only has not diminished, you know, there is uh, some evidence that actually they have expanded um, in the last 20 years. Okay, maybe someone um, in the audience, you know, um, can help me out here with the explanation. Uh, but there's a, a, a couple of uh, uh, interesting um, additional statistics in addition to agriculture that I'd like to point out. You, you look at manufacturing, right? Um, the share of uh, manufacturing activities in, in terms of employment, you know, um, is about uh, 16%. This is in 2020. That's about the same percentage um, of uh, the uh, manufacturing employment in urban areas 20 years ago. In other words, we are not experiencing what uh, the, uh, um, the East Asian tigers uh, like uh, Japan, South Korea, uh, Singapore, or, or Hong Kong were experiencing you know, 20 or 30 years ago, where they saw this shift from agriculture into first textile in, and then uh, um, you know, um, um, high-end manufacturing and then high-end surfaces later on. Um, if anything, it looks like if, uh, if you look at the number for surfaces like trade, right? Trade uh, contributed to about 23% here of uh, the workforce uh, in the urban areas. Um, it, it seems like uh, we are going straight from agriculture, you know, to a surface-based industry, um, you know, effectively bypassing that stage where we rely more on manufacturing. You know, um, at least uh, this is my reading you know, um, of the data. I'm very interested uh, in, in getting uh, some feedback here from my distinguished uh, discussions. Okay, so uh, here is uh, another important topic um, in um, urban, um, uh, or urban development, you know, which is uh, the uh, role of a density. So what is uh, density? It's the ratio of a population, you know, to the area, right? It's a measure of uh, how concentrated, how concentrated uh, the population are in cities. Um, and uh, this is a very nice study you know, published uh, 2019 in the Journal of Urban Economics that basically summarize, you know, um, uh, many of the, the previous uh, econometric analysis it says that a 1% increase in density is associated with higher wages, you know, um, higher innovation in terms of pet, patent activities, uh, range of consumption, you know, um, preservation of a green space if you care about the environment, um, lower car use, that means less use of a fossil fuel, um, but also at the same time, Right, uh, there's a downside of a density. You know, um, uh, rent is a higher. You know, a housing is more expensive, uh, more traffic, right? Um, more congestion. You know, um, higher pol pollution concentration uh, has an implication for health. You know, um, higher inequality uh, between uh, the uh, unskilled and skilled workers, and higher mortality risk. 
So there's a downside here. But you know, um, if we just focus on the economic uh, variables here, right? Um, in, in particular, look at the number for uh, density elasticity of weight. So, so 0 0.08 here tells us that for every 1% uh, increase in density, right? There is a corresponding 0.08% um, uh, increase in wages, okay? Um, that is a higher for developing countries, you know, um, like uh, Indonesia, than for developed countries. And, and what, it, what it tells us is, is that uh, the uh, importance of a density um, is even more so for developing countries uh, like Indonesia than for the developed economies. Okay, so if uh, density is important, right? Um, maybe we should look at the densest uh, cities in Indonesia. Uh, <clears throat> so um, uh, there is one number here that, that I uh, re really want somebody to uh, kind of double check for me uh, because it seems like an outlier. You think about Kupang, right? Uh, look at the density for Kupang. That is uh, 16,000, close actually to 17,000 people per square kilometer. Um, you know, um, so um, hopefully, and um, I get all the raw data here correct. Uh, it, that, that is uh, significantly higher density than even Jakarta, you know, um, with uh, a population density of about 16,000 people per square kilometers. But otherwise, you know, if you, uh, for now, right, just uh, consider Kupang to be an outlier. Right, um, the rest of the list, you know, seems to be making sense. Right, it's a, it's a sensible list. You know, um, we expect uh, these cities, um, you know, mostly uh, in Java, with the exception of uh, Medan, you know, to be uh, the um, densest cities uh, in Indonesia. And just for completeness, I also have uh, the population, um, the list of the least dense, right, the most sparsely populated. Cities in Indonesia, you know, um, uh, at, at the bottom here, uh, there is a Padang city. But uh, Padang is a, somewhere in the middle with a density of about um, 900 people per square kilometer, if I remember the statistics correctly. Okay. <clears throat> so, some very preliminary analysis, you know, I apologize, that is not part of the uh, slides that I submitted last night. You know, um, I, um, cook the numbers, um, you know, just a, a, a couple of nights ago uh, with the data uh, that my colleague um, Adi Ahmad Purawan provided, okay? Uh, but uh, basically, I'm interested in the association between per capita income growth, uh, this is the data that I have uh, between 2010 and 2020, and initial population density, right? Initial, because the, the first year that I have in the data is for 2010, okay? Um, so there, there is a, um, a few economists uh, in the audience, uh, including uh, Professor Budi. You know, I'm not making any claim here about causality, okay? Let, let me just as I say it out loud here. This is just association, um, you know, um, further uh, analysis uh, is definitely required be before, you know, um, I can even begin uh, to make a causal inference. But just as a correlation, right? Um, you look at a specification one here where I regress uh, pop, uh, per capita income growth against initial density, okay? And if you look at the coefficient for log density, right? Um, that is a significant at the 0.1% the, uh, level. Okay, um, so that's, uh, you know, um, you can think of it as uh, the gross effect of a density on a subsequent growth um, in per capita income. In other words, you know, um, there is uh, at least some evidence, if not, you know, necessarily causality, that higher initial density is associated with a faster subsequent growth um, in per capita income. This is at the city level. Right, at the city, city level, using the data for 93 um, in Indonesian cities between 2010 and 2020. Um, uh, we, we play around you know, um, with uh, more controls. So specification two, for example, controls uh, for the share of our services uh, in, uh, in CD GDP, okay? 
Um, uh, so um, as it turns out, the estimated coefficient for density B1 remains robust. You know, um, the level of significance, you know, went down a little bit uh, to 2.5 percent. Uh, you know, but still significant at 5 percent, right? It is also interesting that the coefficient for uh, surface share in GDP is uh, significant at the 1% level. And what that means is that cities with a higher percentage of surfaces, right, in 2010, are also the cities that grow faster between 2010 and 2020. Okay? Um, and if I replace um, surfaces with a manufacturing and agriculture, then the coefficients, you know, for agriculture and manufacturing are actually negative. You know, I'm kind of like the evidence for American cities, okay? Um, cities that have higher exposure to the sort of old economy, you know, um, industry and manufacturing in 2010 are also the cities that grow slower subsequently between 2010 and 2020. You know, um, I'll, I'll be most interested in, in getting a feedback here uh, from my distinguished uh, discussions, as well as from the audience. Um, <clears throat> Specification three is uh, probably you know um, the most complete one you know um, based on the data that we have right now again a very prelim preliminary I have a control for the share of uh, females um, in the total population so we can think of it as the uh, proxy for you know um, openness right um, how open cities are you know to uh, uh, to female workers. Okay, um, you know, virtually no difference, you know, um, the result uh, for the impact of a density is, is, uh, is robust. It continues to be significant at a 2.5% level. Likewise, uh, the coefficient for um, services share in GDP continues to be significant. Okay, um, and I, I think um, uh, the coefficient for female here um, is, uh, is also significant, although the sign is negative. Okay, um, so um, uh, CDS is a higher uh, proportion of uh, female workers in 2010, you know, um, tend to be CDS that uh, grow a little bit slower on average uh, uh, than, uh, than other CDS. Okay, so um, in, in the rest of my presentation, I'm going to try to connect um, my uh, descriptive uh, analysis here with uh, the theoretical framework, okay? In, in particular, uh, uh, the uh, theoretical framework of uh, complex systems, you know, um, or uh, complexity economics. Um, and the pioneer here is this institution, you know, um, located in New Mexico. Um, that's a, a American state called the Santa Fe Institute. Um, so maybe it's a worthwhile to talk a little bit about my trajectory, you know, um, as a scholar, you know, um, how I get into this, uh, this research here. Um, I was uh, initially very interested in maybe more traditional economic development topics and still interested um, in uh, poverty and inequality. Um, I developed um, a financial CG model, financial computable geological view model, you know, I'm for my PhD thesis. Uh, that's for the uh, analysis, distribution analysis of the 1997 Asian financial crisis. Um, but uh, I, I get distracted very quickly after I finish my dissertation. Um, you know, typically people get, you know, um, three, four papers out of my thesis. I get only one chapter actually published um, out of my uh, doctoral dissertation. Um, it, and it's not even uh, the, uh, the core chapter of my thesis, you know, um, it's a chapter on uh, structural past analysis that got published. Uh, and I, I, I may actually never, you know, uh, publish uh, the rest of my dissertation, you know, um, uh, because um, I've been moving further away uh, from the CGE literature. And that's because, you know, I, I got interested uh, and maybe, you know, um, falling in love too quickly with the complex system studies but that's what my fellowships at uh, Harvard is about. You know, it was then followed by another two years of a postdoctoral fellowship at MIT. You know, um, where I uh, published, you know, um, about seven papers on, on complex system studies. You know, um, um, and uh, my research has diversified. You know, um, a lot uh, since my uh, postdoctoral days. 
Um, and I'm, I'm starting to uh, come back and got more interested uh, in uh, uh, social inequality um, and, and, and other um, economic justice issues you know, um, of that nature. But you know, um, I consider complex system studies you know, to be uh, you know, um, are the core research, you know, are the papers that I got cited the most, you know, are the papers in which um, I uh, examine uh, the complex system implication of a city population. Um, <clears throat> so what started this movement of uh, complex system studies uh, is this uh, 1987 meeting um, in, at Santa Fe. Um, and if you look at the list of participants, uh, you know, um, you might recognize um, uh, Professor Ken Arrow, you know, um, obviously Nobel Prize winner in economics for his uh, contribution to general equilibrium theory. Um, but unless you're in physics, right, you may not recognize the other names. You know, there is actually another Nobel Prize winner here, Professor Phil Anderson uh, of uh, Princeton University won the Nobel Prize winner in physics. But um, the, the uh, one scholar Right, um, who uh, uh, came up with uh, the uh, um, question, so sort of driving, uh, you know, um, the uh, meeting and then the sub subsequent institutionalization of uh, uh, complex system studies is uh, Professor Stuart Kaufman, uh, who's a biologist at the University of Pennsylvania, and he was asking, you know, um, seemingly a very innocent question. Why do economists always think in terms of equilibrium? It's a very innocent question. It's coming from biology, right? In biology, when anything comes to equilibrium, that means that organism or individual is dead. That's what, that's what it means in biology to be in equilibrium. So in biology, there's nothing interesting that people can study just by looking at equilibrium. Okay, so this is you know, the uh, complete opposite of what we do in economics. Remember, I did my thesis on CG. You know, um, I was and still I'm a believer in general equilibrium uh, theory. Okay, but I'm you know, um, <clears throat> this is uh, what started it all, right? And maybe we should go around of a traditional you know um, equilibrium framework and consider uh, you know, um, other framework or processes that look into the dynamics that are not necessarily converging, you know, um, into a, an equilibrium outcome. There is a more recent statement here by a professor, you know, um, W. Brian Arthur from Stanford University. Uh, and I provide, you know, um, the definition of uh, complex system studies, you know, um, but it, it's uh, essentially the notion of, there is a mismatch between individual intention and the aggregate outcome, okay? So um, individually, there is a desire to do one thing, let's say A, but then the outcome is something that is uh, different from the individual intention. That is uh, the essence of a complex system studies, or at least uh, one of the uh, uh, features of a complex system studies. You know, um, Tom Schelling, you know, it's a classic study. Um, he won the Nobel Prize in 1978. Uh, I'm sorry, this is a, a paper published in 1978 for which he was awarded the Nobel Prize basically for showing that, you know, um, even though individuals don't have a strong preference to live with people who are like them, right? Colloquially, even though people are not inherently racist, we would still observe at the aggregate level this separation, you know, um, Americans call segregation between white and black settlements, okay? So the explanation according to Schelling is not because Americans are racist, okay? I and mean, that is a long story, but um, basically, you know, it, it is uh, that mismatch uh, between our individual intent and the outcome at the aggregate level. Now, um, in economics, there's actually nothing new about this uh, notion of uh, uh, mismatch uh, between micro intention and macro outcome. You know, the father of economics, you know, Adam Smith, you know, back when economics was not a thing, it wasn't even a discipline, okay, um, came up with 
You know, um, the uh, classic canonical example of a positive unintended consequence. Uh, so according to Adam Smith, right? Um, this is a very famous uh, quotation here. Um, if every individual is just, you know, um, focused on what they are good in doing, right? Just focusing on their own, you know, um, uh, interest, you know, um, be being essentially very selfish, nevertheless, on the aggregate, right? You're gonna get an economy that is uh, super efficient, okay? So at the individual level, we are not interested in promoting, you know, an efficient economy. We just wanna be, you know, doing what is best for ourselves. You know, I'm being purely self-interested, but at the aggregate level, we still have this outcome, right? Now, which is uh, optimal in terms of efficiency for everyone. You know, um, so this uh, notion of uh, mismatch between micro behavior and macro outcome, you know, has been around at, at least as, as old as economics itself. Okay, so um, a complex system perspective, you know, um, have been uh, applied successfully uh, in, in many different fields, and in particular, the, the ones that I uh, have been working on myself is in the area of a cities, you know, um, we look at cities, really, you know, um, a city is the, the result of a complex interactions of many autonomous individuals. Okay, so that means if we try to aggregate uh, this individual behavior, individual intent into an equation, right? Um, we might come into a fallacy because uh, the aggregate outcome is not necessarily a reflection of the individual intent. Okay, <clears throat> um, so one signature of a complex system is the, the uh, so-called of uh, the so-called power law. Uh, so, um, uh, the probably uh, the most intuitive way to explain power law is by looking at things that are not uh, power law distributed, or in other words, you know, um, scale dependent processes. And most things in life are scale dependent. You know, a um, classic example is the height of human being. We don't observe people who are, you know, um, seven meters seven meters tall. Right, um, even the professional basketball players, you know, um, at the highest, you know, they, they are maybe 2.2 meters tall, but otherwise we don't observe, you know, um, super tall individuals um, like in the movies, right? So this is a classic example where there is a scale, there is the mean or the median, where the rest of the distribution is kind of, a, you know, um, focused or centralized on that. Uh, on that, um, on that mean or median. But not all things are picked around a single value, okay? Um, some have a very long tail for distribution and among those things uh, that um, have an enormous dynamic range, you know, sometimes over, you know, orders of magnitude, are uh, the sizes of a cities, okay? So this is a, a paper published by uh, uh, Professor Newman from the University of Michigan um, and he provided, you know, um, examples of uh, power law distributed processes, you know, um, word frequency, for example, uh, citations of our scientific papers, you know, tend to be very highly concentrated, you know, um, among the Nobel Prize winners, right? And then the rest of us, you know, um, we are lucky to get a few hundred citations. Um, but to look at the bottom two, you know, um, the wealth of the richest people, that's an example of a power law distribution. You know, um, we have uh, the uh, Bill Gates and uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Um, and then, you know, um, we have everybody else, right? So very high concentration of wealth among the top 1%. Um, but then we have a long tail, right? Um, where everyone else is kind of like, like just uh, average or even below average. And a population of cities is another example of uh, power law or scale free distribution, you know, um, where we have this uh, giant cities um, and primate city like Jakarta, for example, that is uh, four times, you know, the size of the second largest city. Okay. <clears throat> um, so one manifestation of a power law is the so-called rank size distribution. 
let, let me just uh, walk you through very quickly here what it means um, using this a very simple example. Um, one implication, one implication um, of the uh, uh, power law distribution, also known as the Zips law in the cities, is that the nth rank city, okay, um, would have uh, you know one over n the population of the largest city. So, for example, New York City is the largest population, right? Los Angeles is ranked second, rank number two, with a population of about 4 million. So the population of LA is about one half the population of New York City. That's the essence of a Ziv's law or the power law distribution. So if we go down, we go down the rank, looking at city number three, Chicago, where I live right now, if a population about 1.6 million people, right? That's about one third, about one third the population of New York City. Okay, so that what that means, you know, um, the end rank city has one over and the population of the largest city. Okay, that relationship is not um, perfect, but it gets better as we go down the uh, uh, the list of uh, cities by population. Okay, um, so I believe I, yeah. So um, uh, uh, the, uh, if, if we plot uh, the uh, uh, population you know, um, against the ranking in lock lock space, you know, I'm gonna have a very tightly cluster of observations you know, um, along a straight line. So Paul Krugman, another Nobel Prize winner, when, when he saw this, he said that this is a really you know, um, unusual so it's really weird, you know, I'm using Paul Krugman's word, that is a, it's very rare in economics that we see, you know, this kind of very tight distribution, you know, I'm around a straight line. And we don't even need any additional control. We just need two variables, you know, about the population and the ranking. Prof, uh, Yuri, uh, we have yes, uh, 15 minutes left. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so w once again, you know, um, the, the significance of a population uh, <clears throat> um, is uh, articulated um, in, uh, in different ways. Uh, th this is um, a, a series of publication uh, by Baton Core of the University of Chicago and Jeffrey West of the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, in nature and science, um, a, a couple of papers, you know, one in nature and one in science, uh, they showed that the uh, population is the most important determinant of most uh, characteristics of a city. In other words, everything that we care about uh, in cities like infrastructure, uh, like housing and employment, okay, and wealth creation and innovation, right? Um, they all scale, in other words, you know, respect uh, the uh, uh, power law distribution. So um, why, why don't we observe a normal distribution of cities, you know, in terms of our population, you know, um, and normal distribution on the left-hand side, right? We should observe, you know, um, typical size of cities, you know, um, maybe some variation, but not a lot around the mean or the median. What we instead have is the Zips law, or, or otherwise known as the power law distribution, where very many small towns, you know, coexist uh, with a few mega cities like the Jakarta's and the Surabaya's uh, in in Indonesia. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so uh, I'm gonna not skip, uh, you know, um, slides, but maybe going through them without a narrative in the interest of time. But essentially, what um, I came up with with my uh, co-authors is uh, uh, first a theoretical paper that show. Um, how uh, the uh, Zips law came about, you know, um, based on certain behavioral assumptions uh, about the uh, uh, individuals uh, who live in cities. You know, um, uh, the theoretical underpinning here is not equilibrium economics that rely on uh, perfect rationality, but instead it's the notion of a bounded rationality. There's a, another Nobel Prize winner, Herb Simon, um, who actually started his uh, career at Illinois Tech. You know, um, I'm, I'm very honored that I'm teaching in the same department as he was um, early on in uh, Simon's uh, uh, career. 
this is a um, you know, relatively recent statement by Michael Batty, a fellow of the Regional Science Association International. And um, for uh, scholars like Batty, you know, um, computation is uh, the way to go. Uh, it's the third way of doing science that perhaps is even more important, uh, even more important than uh, statistics, you know, um, or using uh, formal deductions uh, uh, like a proof or things of that nature. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So we can talk about, you know, um, how this all connect uh, to regional science and the founder, you know, um, uh, Professor Walter Iser. Uh, uh, this is uh, the classic uh, 1956 book by the regional science founder, you know, um, Professor Walter Iser, you know, um, whom invited uh, Professor Hendra S. Mara uh, in the 1970s, you know, um, to the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and what is uh, surprising about this book this, uh, this was published in 1956, is that Professor Iser used many of the terminologies that we modern um, complex system scientists use, you know, um, like increasing returns, right? A few years ago, um, Paul Romer won a Nobel Prize, you know, um, for his model for increasing returns, you know, um, and then uh, Bob Lucas uh, won a few years, a few years back, right, uh, essentially. Uh, but introducing increasing returns in economic development. Um, but you know, um, uh, this is a tribute, you know, to uh, how uh, uh, prescient, you know, um, Professor Isaac was, you know, um, in the 1950s. Uh, he was already thinking about. If, if he didn't have necessarily the mathematical firepower of a today's economist, but he was uh, clearly thinking about the concept that we today use. Uh, in, in, in modern complex system economics. Okay, um, so uh, new economic geography, you know, um, is uh, considered to be uh, also new regional science. Um, it's the rebirth of uh, regional science. Um, there are some criticisms about it. It's uh, a little bit uh, too, uh, you know, too formal, too mathematical. But what, what I'm going to point out is that the model that Paul Krugman, you know, um, Masa Fujita, and Anthony Fanables proposed in their book and also the 1992 paper uh, in the Journal of Political Economy, it doesn't have a closed form solution. If you think about, you know, the gold standard in economics, you know, we need to have a closed form solutions. Okay, the model that Krugman and others propose um, associated with the new economic geography doesn't have a close from solution. So what does that mean? The only way that we can learn anything from a model is by using computer simulations. Okay, computer simulations is the only resort. Um, and and that's uh, pretty much you know um, what I and a colleague did in uh, um, in our uh, 2007 2007 paper in the Journal of Economic Dynamics and Control. I'm gonna just um, go this There's a lot of uh, papers. You know, um, a lot of contributions, but none of them actually come up with a bottom-up explanation, you know, um, about the emergence of the Zips law uh, in cities. And we believe we are among the first, if not the first, you know, who came up. And hopefully, I can humbly say that we were among the first who came up with a bottom-up explanation, you know, how power law distribution came about. And the result is uh, something like this. You know, this is a distribution of a population of Americans across American cities. You know, we have a New York City um, in the East Coast uh, to the right of your screen. And then the second largest city, you know, Los Angeles, is to the left of your screen. Okay, so pretty much the you know, concentration of Americans, you know, um, in the coastal cities. And then um, in the middle, right, in the hinterland of the United States, it is a very empty, you know, basically. Okay, well, one uh, characteristic of the Zips law. Uh, in the U.S., I want to make sure that I, I actually uh, talk about uh, how uh, Indonesia compares, you know, um, to uh, the evidence, you know, for the uh, uh, the developed world. So um, uh, this is uh, the um, similar plot, similar plot where we have the lock of population on the vertical axis, on the y-axis, against the ranking on the uh, x-axis, okay? So if you look at the dot at the uh, 
at the leftmost side of your screen, right? There's a one dot at 16. That's Jakarta, okay? Um, the largest city in, uh, in Indonesia, uh, where the population is expressed in terms of uh, the natural law. Okay, so that's uh, rank number one. So what, what is the log of one? That's just zero, right? So that's why it's in the uh, y, um, y axis. And what, what is uh, clear from this observation is that it's not a straight line like the plot for the US, right? This is a classic, you know, so-called banana shape where uh, essentially um, the largest city, Jakarta, is uh, too large. But then the smaller cities, you know, down the road, like the, the Sabangs and the Padang Sidempuans, you know, the smaller cities in Indonesia are not big enough, you know, to kind of uh, pull the distribution uh, to a straight line. Okay. So, um, in other words, you know, the distribution of population of cities in Indonesia is actually quite typical, certainly not representative. You know, um, it doesn't respect. Uh, the textbook uh, definition in urban economics of uh, rank size distributions. You know, um, so what is the explanation, right? What is the explanation? Why is uh, Jakarta too big, and why are the smaller cities like uh, Sabang and Padang Sidempuan are too small compared to uh, uh, the mid-sized cities? Um, so one explanation is offered again by Professor Glazer of Harvard, um, along with a, a former student, um, Roberto Ades. Uh, and he came up with a very interesting hypothesis here. You look at the uh, uh, two by two matrix here, so to speak. And what you see here at the top left quadrant, OK? Um, in stable democracies, and talk about Japan, South Korea, as well as uh, uh, the Western democracies, um, you know, um, perhaps uh, also India, right? Stable democracies are places where urban population is the least concentrated. Okay, that's the top left corner. In contrast, if you look at the bottom right, that's for unstable dictatorships. So um, it, it's not only uh, we have uh, dictators, but also there's a lot of... Uh, Turnovers. So There's a lot of uh, churning, like one dictator after another. These are the places where you know um, urban population is the most concentrated. Okay, so um, what um, Ades and Professor Glazer argued, okay, uh, is that um, in unstable democracies, okay, um, the capital elite population, maybe the most educated, uh, skilled workers. You know, have the power, uh, you know, to induce the government to transfer maybe higher capital expenditures on the capital city, and in turn, you know, it is this transfer will attract migrants. You know, um, so there's a sort of a, the positive feedback effect. You know, um, uh, more migrants came to the city, more expenditures. You know, um, and that's going to attract even more people to come to the city. You know, um, and so on. Right? It's got it's that like a snowballing process. Uh, where uh, big cities initially become even bigger, you know, um, in the, in the long run. Okay. I'm um, also um, rent seekers uh, coming to the capital, you know, to rent seek. Um, that also increase uh, the uh, city's population. Okay. So um, according to uh, Ades and Glazer, and I think um, it, it is a, a pretty, you know, um, sensible uh, argument. Uh, dictators uh, have uh, more dictatorships that have more concentration of population. Uh, since you know um, they are willing to ignore uh, the, the wishes of the politically weak hinterland, they are after all dictators that have to respect, you know, um, the, uh, the general population, right? Um, elections are probably controlled, um, so they found that it, dictatorships have main cities that are about 45 percent larger uh, uh, than um, cities in countries with uh, non. Dictatorial regimes. So here's what is interesting about uh, their paper. Even among today's democracies, okay, democracies that have a history of dictatorships, okay, even among democracies in the sample, those that were dictatorships in the past, you know, um, continue to have a central cities that are 40% larger than those of countries that were always democracies in the beginning. Okay, so um, we think about the legacy 
of uh, Bung Karno and, and Pak Harto, right? And many people think that um, they are uh, with a very strong government, right? Um, even though right now election is free, we are now one of the, uh, we should be proud of the fact that we are a country where um, election you know, um, is uh, among the freest in the world. Right? Today, we are one of the most democratic countries in the world, but we still have that past and history. And there is a one explanation uh, uh, why the largest uh, city, you know, um, the Jakarta, continues to be uh, you know, the urban giant you know, um, among uh, Indonesian cities. Prof, okay, um, so uh, some thoughts here about what we're going to do next. Excuse me, research, Dr. Yuri. You know, um, uh, Sorry for interrupting yeah. you. Uh, I think we just have a few minutes left. We can uh, proceed okay, yeah. to the conclusion. Yes. So um, I'm, I'm going to the conclusion here. You know, looking at some data we already have, uh, they're definitely looking for more, more variables. Uh, you know, um, there's some discussion about our challenges about the uh, the kind of cities that we have. You know, the fusion of uh, Desa and Kota. I'm gonna close here with uh, some thoughts about you know, our policy implication. Uh, we think about what is the optimal size of a city. Maybe there is no such a thing uh, as the optimal size of a city, right? Because um, it depends on the history, um, I mean, and so on. You know, um, we, we should think about the implication for the relocation, of, uh, the relocation plan you know, to Nusantara in Kalimantan, right? Uh, because uh, it's gonna be, you know, um, uh, a, a city with a very low density, and it's going to have implication, you know, um, not just for wages, uh, but also for a lot of things that we care about, like uh, innovations, you know, um, and um, a lot of things that we care about. And, and I'm going to close with the, the uh, 2022 paper here. Still a working paper. You know, um, one of the authors is uh, uh, P Professor um, Arya Gadu, who is now Professor of Economics at Arkansas University. And a very interesting... Um, our finding here is that if you think about density is a good thing, well, they found that, you know, on the other hand, you know, um, very high density could also contribute to less community participation, right? And lower trust, you know. Um, and so I, I think uh, this is, uh, you know, an additional food of thought uh, that everyone should be mindful about it because, uh, uh, you know, um, density and population are not always a good thing. There are downsides that we should be uh, mindful and consider of. I'm going to stop here. Thank you for taking the time. Okay, thank you, Dr. Yuri Mansuri. Give applause to Dr. Yuri Mansuri. <clears throat> thank you for your interesting uh, presentation. Now we proceed uh, to invite our first discussion, Professor Shafruddin Karimi. Professor Shafruddin Karimi, time is yours. Excuse me for a while. There is, uh, <laughs> excuse me for a while. Okay, Prof. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Yuri uh, Mansuri, it's quite an interesting presentation. Uh, you're talking about the trend population and go to the uh, density and the complex interaction between the uh, population in the. Okay, Prof, you are ready? Yes. Okay, uh, Thank you very much. You're welcome, Mr. Prof. Okay, uh, Tom, is your Prof. Friends and colleagues, especially Prof. Yuri from Chicago, I really appreciate your talk. A lot of things I'm learning this morning. And I really would like to, to respond. And please... Uh, Apologize me first if my response is not relevant. First, I would like to, to respond about density. It seems to me that you are in favor of higher densities. And this idea, when we study populations, there are two groups there. Those who are who are in favor in density, like uh, Esther Bostrop and Julian Simons. There's a long, long time I, I studied uh, demography. And there are people in demography 
who are in favor of population planning. They would like to interfere in children productions by introducing family planning. And many high populated countries are given foreign aid in order to reduce their fertility. And Indonesia, I think, is one of them. And the Philippines is countries that do not like population planning, family planning. They don't like it. Now, it turned out that why population growth in Indonesia, if we compare to the Philippines, is still higher than the Philippines. While in the Philippines, they are not really uh, uh, strong in implementing family planning. Okay, through 2050, our population growth will be 2.76%. And many economists also predict that before 2050, we will reach high income countries. If we are not reaching that, we will remain at lower middle income because of uh, demographic dividend will no longer available for Indonesia. So if we look at the population growth, how do you project? With population growth 2.76%, I think we will always have labor to work for the economies rather than a shortage of labor, okay? And then if we look at the economic transformations, the shifting from agriculture to industry, in many places, in many provinces, it doesn't take place. While the population for agriculture I mean the agriculture uh, households between 2003 to 2013 has decreased significantly, while the size of land per household farmer is decreasing too. If we look at the inequality, land inequality between 1993-2003-2013, it has increased. And if we look at the census, agriculture census, they don't include actually the Hageu land in the census. When we look at that how people moving now, more people migrate from rural area to the cities, to the urban areas. And many also rural area belong to the, the type of the Sakota, you know. They are already belong to the municipality, but their lifestyle still belong to the lifestyle of the rural people including Padang, for example, you know. If I compare, for example, West Sumatra and Riau. West Sumatra is always the province that has a positive out migration. And the population growth is lo lower than the province of Riau. In 2000s, Padang is still is still higher population than Pekanbaru. But now Pekanbaru has exceeded the population of Pada. In Pekanbaru, there are many people from West Sumatra migrated to Pekanbaru. And they are doing uh, non-agriculture jobs. And if I 
relate to your finding in another article that studies uh, credits and regional growth in Indonesia, I refer to your last paragraph. You mentioned that decentralization has failed to reduce regional disparities. And how can we imply for regional development policy? What does it mean for regional development policy in the future? We expect local autonomy and decentralization to increase regional equities. But in reality, we observe that has increased. And how your theory, bounded rationality, okay, I'm interested in this. Bounded rationality and zip law and in your other article. Why do you assume bounded rationality? You mentioned that this is a non-equilibrium economics. It seemed to me that you are one of the followers of uh, heterodox economics, I guess, I guess, okay? When we study bounded rationality in relation to macroeconomic policy, we need actually government interventions, not perfect markets, not perfect competitions, but there should be uh, intervention through regional planning. In your observations, will our regional planning now will lead to equalization of progress? In my observation, it will not, okay? In my observation, not, not based on my research, in my observation only. Because the money that uh, flows to the regions, to the province, to the kota and kabupatens, it will return to the center through many kind of mechanism. And the money again spent in the center in Jakarta or in Java, not in the, re in the regions. I think this one, one factor that may explain why regional disparity tend to increase rather than to decrease. And how do you, do you observe? This is response by the planning authority. Quality will, will encourage, will push the migration from the rural area to the cities. They used to be farmers, but they moved to the cities, not working as uh, labor in manufacturing, but they are working in service sector, informal service sector, not formal service sector, but informal. And in the, in the rural area, agriculture land is converted to non-agriculture that owned by the people, by the, the farmer. But many agriculture land is now controlled by the corporate, become perkebunan. So there might be a shift from agriculture, traditional agriculture, to the commercialized agriculture that is owned by the capital. While the farmer themselves remains poor. Even though now there is a trend that uh, poverty in rural area is decreasing while in the urban area is increasing. In my understanding, that is only because of the migration of the poverty from rural area into the urban area. And it might increase in the future 
projecting that more than 70% of our population will stay in the urban area. And this is also a threat, in my opinion, to the production of food. Many agricultural lands, especially sawah lands, close to the palm oil plantations, in response to the market mechanism, they have they have converted also to to palm oil plantations. In many area, I observe that, especially in the transmigration area. Earlier, they were planned for food agriculture. But since they are very close to the palm oil plantation, now they converted to that. And my question is how the study of regional economics, especially regional deployment planning, may respond to that. Because today we all witness how important is food production. The war between Russia and Ukraine has affected food price, including to Padang. You know? Everything has increased. Every price, cons consumer product price has increased. The egg price, the rice price <laughs> has increased. If we continue with uh, the current uh, natural uh, progress, it is difficult for us to, to predict that we will be uh, strong in food production. We might, we might continue to import food because of the, the temptation from the urbanizations where many good land in the cities, such as Padang, has been converted to buildings, housings, and normal sawa, while before it was a good irrigation. And I believe this is not uh, a tendency in Padang only, but in many, many regions in Indonesia, in Desa Kota, that they converted their good lands, good for agriculture, now they, they transform into, into buildings. And how this will affect our regional economic stability in the future. I think, and that is my comment, Professor Yuri. And thank you very much. I hope we can meet again in order to, to talk about regional plannings. And I also want to express here my debt to the late Prof. Andrais Mara because he was the one who taught us uh, regional disparity, why it is very important to study, and economic inequalities. I took his class in 1975 on regional economics. In that class, he taught us on, on how to calculate Williamson index. He taught us on how to calculate uh, Gini index. In 1979, he was writing uh, a paper on income inequality in Indonesia, in Indonesia province. He is trying to, to, to prove the validity of Kuznet curve in Indonesia. I was also encouraged by him. Then I wrote my BS thesis. The title is Land Inequality Across Province in Indonesia. So I hope the spirit of Professor Hendra will stimulate us, especially the younger generations. And again, I thank you very much for call, friends and colleagues, for Prof. Budis, Prof. Arif, and especially the Dean of Faculty of Economics and other leaders in the Faculty of Economics and Business. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Prof.
<laughs> okay, thank you, Prof. Now we proceed to Dr. Mia Amalia to give some uh, discussion about uh, this topic. Dr. Mia Amalia, time is yours. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ibu Adila, and also uh, thank you, Prof. Arif, and also Prof. Budi uh, for inviting me to this uh, event. Um, on uh, Professor Hendra uh, Esmara lecture on regional uh, development. And also uh, thank you Pak Dekan uh, for hosting uh, this event. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Pak Yuri uh, for, for the lecture. Uh, the team is uh, very uh, relevant and very beneficial for us uh, in Bapenas, especially for uh, our unit uh, which is in charge on urban development planning in Indonesia and also for uh, to Professor Sarifuddin Karim uh, for his insight on uh, rural ur urban relation. Uh, really honored to have this opportunity to come and learn from uh, Pakar in this field and also a very humbling uh, experience for me. And maybe uh, I will uh, begin with the uh, policy background uh, next. Uh, slide uh, two. Uh, back in uh, 2019, uh, the uh, Bapanas uh, developed Indonesian uh, vision of uh, 2045. And uh, one section is on uh, urban development. We call it a national urban policy 2045. Uh, the vision is uh, uh, development 2045. It has uh, five mission. And one of the mission is related uh, to our uh, discussion today, which is uh, realize, uh, relate, real, li, realizing uh, balance, uh, prosperous and uh, equitable uh, national urban system. And uh, this mission has uh, five uh, policies uh, related to the mission. The first one is uh, next. Uh, strengthening uh, globally competitive metropolitan and uh, national activity center. Uh, the second is developing well-connected medium large metropolitan cities outside Java. Uh, the third is developing a new national government center uh, in Kalimantan, uh, developing non-exploitative and mutually beneficial rural urban uh, linkages. And the last one is developing smart urban growth and effective uh, urban boundaries. In his uh, writing, uh, Pa Yuri has written that uh, an incomplete understanding of nature uh, of urban interconnectedness can only lead to under uh, appreciation of the uh, pow powerful uh, forces that shape uh, city development and inevitable to misguided policy. So hopefully this uh, national uh, urban policy uh, can address problem we are facing uh, today and also a uh, future need uh, of urban uh, development in Indonesia. And um, we, are, we also recognize uh, the complexity of uh, urban system in Indonesia. Next. So um, we need a deep and detailed understanding of uh, urban-rural relation before the planning process could begin. Um, as we also uh, understand, uh, most city uh, in Indonesia uh, has accidents of the capacity of environment, so we can observe from traffic jam in um, big cities, for instance, and also uh, urban area development is uh, transitioning uh, to more uh, equitable, economically uh, viable, and resource uh, efficient pattern. Uh, our urban system inputs and outputs are also uh, interrelated with uh, urban, uh, sorry, with rural area. So that, as we can observe in the figure uh, here, we have uh, currently we have two systems, uh, urban and rural system that are connected by flows of inputs uh, from both system uh, that are needed by society such as uh, commodities, uh, capital information. Nowadays, it's, it is very important, natural resources, and also waste and uh, pollution. Uh, those interactions are uh, dynamic and develop uh, through time and through activities in, in both sides. 
uh, therefore uh, we, we really need to see this uh, rising complexity uh, created uh, uh, within this uh, two system today. And uh, Professor, uh, sorry, uh, pa pa Yuri also uh, add in his writing that uh, we should really see this system through human uh, behavior in, those bo in both uh, space to shed light on how, how uh, we can interact uh, uh, between uh, these two systems uh, so that uh, in the future we can have this type of uh, contemporary uh, city uh, that we can plan and also develop in the future. And um, we can go to slide uh, six. Next. So according uh, to Payuri, we have now uh, different type of uh, policy to be developed. The first one is the top-down policy and the second one is the bottom-up. Uh, according to him, uh, the top-down policy is no longer uh, sufficient. Maybe we can uh, try to see uh, in one example here. Uh, if you look at the study done by Ministry of Spatial Planning and um, Agraria, or we call it in Indonesian ATR uh, BPN, we can see that the top uh, down policies such as assigning uh, cities at, as a national activity center or as a regional activity center is not entirely uh, successful. Here we can see that 62 percent of um, regional uh, strategic uh, uh, activity uh, center uh, is, uh, are overperforming in Java, so they act like uh, national uh, center uh, instead of regional center. While in outer Java, about 70% of this uh, national center act as regional center. Uh, it, this type of pol policy can lead us into uh, uh, some issues. Uh, for instance, um, uh, what happened in the field, uh, this type of policy can lead to uh, less investment needed by the region and also by the nation. And uh, urban dweller who lives in these cities or live in this area, they receive uh, less um, basic services from the, from, uh, from the local government. Uh, we could extend this type of analysis to observe uh, more impact of agglomeration uh, in those cities because as we understand, uh, the, no the national uh, priority area uh, in Indonesia, we call it metropolitan area. But uh, now the question is, uh, do we provide enough services to people live in those uh, metropolitan area? Maybe we should uh, try to uh, try more exercise such as what uh, has been uh, uh, taught by uh, Pak Yuri in his uh, lecture previously. Uh, next, so if we use uh, 2022 uh, population estimation done by National uh, Statistical Agency, we try to mimic what uh, Pak Yuri has done for, for Indonesia. In the first uh, figure, we try to plot estimated urban population data versus uh, city rank for all cities in Indonesia. And in the second figure below, uh, all cities are divided into seven group of island uh, and small islands. Metropolitan such as Jabodetabek or maybe Dangro represent uh, only by one dot in this uh, figure. And, uh, but then uh, those, uh, sorry, those uh, little figure here uh, represent all kabupaten and kota within the delineation of the metropolitan area. So it could be overestimated as well because uh, we calculate all the population within the area, not only the population of the um, urban dwellers in the area. So if we use the equation, we can see that in general, we should do more detailed analysis uh, later on. So uh, disclaimer that it is a very quick analysis we did and we might need a lot of input from uh, Payuri and colleague, but we can see that uh, only uh, maybe in, in Java, we can see that uh, the urban system hold the jeeps uh, long, uh, strong, stronger. 
uh, compared to other region, uh, which indicate, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, a positive impact of agglomeration economies, including uh, accumulation of knowledge and economic of uh, scales in production system. Um, as, uh, but uh, we also find uh, some kind of uh, issues if we are using this uh, dichotomous um, uh, grouping uh, between uh, urban and rural. So uh, currently, uh, we, uh, in, in Bapenas, uh, we try to uh, analyze uh, these two systems and uh, try to understand more about uh, the relation between urban and rural area. And uh, we are now uh, in the process of discussing uh, that probably in the future we will not use this uh, dichotomous um, grouping, but more on the degree of urbanization. Uh, we attempt to acknowledge rural uh, urban landscape, not uh, in a dichotomous way, but on the continuum uh, manner. Uh, but it is now uh, underway. Uh, hopefully, uh, in the future, we can uh, better understand uh, spatial pattern of urbanization, and it will help us in the future to formulate uh, evidence-based and uh, robust uh, urban uh, future or urban policy. So. Uh, Next, uh, main uh, takeaways that uh, we learn uh, from uh, this uh, uh, lecture and also from all uh, paper uh, that Payuri has produced is that the spatial pattern of uh, urban population can uh, provide inputs uh, for the preparation of uh, the um, next national long-term development plan uh, 2025 to 2045. And uh, bottom up, this is interesting, bottom up compu computational modeling such as agent based model, cellular uh, automata, and network uh, theory could assist a uh, policymaker to better understand uh, behavioral realism. Uh, because we are to use, <laughs> we are uh, uh, more. more um, familiar with uh, top-down uh, policy uh, rather than this uh, new uh, bottom-up bottom approach. So aiming for a compact and mixed-use uh, urban area, I think it is also uh, important to increase densities and also to, uh, to reduce sprawl uh, to foster uh, social cohesiveness and also innovation, uh, especially in our uh, future city. Uh, but also it, it will need uh, to be accompanied by better public services uh, to reduce negative externalities of uh, urban, urban area and urbanization. So future uh, urbanization policy can no longer be as authoritative, we think, as uh, what we have observed uh, in the past and also uh, today. Uh, it should be directed to induce uh, sustainable transformation uh, of urbanization to changes in human behavior. Because uh, if you uh, look at our uh, medium term plan uh, for urban area, it is more on uh, physical development instead of uh, social um, uh, cohes cohesiveness and things like that. Uh, but I think in the future we need uh, to understand uh, urbanization from the point of view of, view of uh, individual behavior and interaction. Also, uh, what I learned from Pabudi maybe 10 years ago is on decentralization, decentralized decision making a process that we also need uh, to uh, understand. Because uh, as uh, Payuri had said, uh, the bottom up approach uh, also recognize how people um, manage uh, to, to work and to live in cities using their own decision. Uh, uh, also, we also need to see this new type of understanding of future scenarios uh, of the city size and distribution in Indonesia because it is essential uh, to design a more uh, equitable and sustainable uh, regional development. Um, Maybe uh, 
that's all from us, uh, Bu Adila. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mia. Give peace, give applause. <clears throat> okay, uh, we now proceed to uh, Dr. Yuri to give some feedback. Uh, Dr. Yuri, time is here. Uh, we have uh, around 15 minutes for your comment. Thank you. Thank you so much for both Dr. Safrudin and Dr. Mia Melia for the comments. Um, <clears throat> Let me just uh, make a couple of points uh, he, uh, here. Um, and it's not a direct response uh, to uh, Professor, to Dr. Amelia's comment uh, necessarily, um, because I certainly support the idea of uh, more integrated analysis that combine uh, cities and the uh, hinterland, little areas you know, um, perhaps within a system perspective, because when we think about cities, right? This is just urban areas, but um, we talk about regions, you know, um, then we have to consider, you know, the uh, hinterland as well, the rural areas. Uh, and think about relationship between um, the uh, uh, urban core um, and, and the, uh, um, and the rural areas, as well as with the uh, suburban areas. Right, kind of uh, the uh, middle space uh, between the uh, core uh, urban areas um, and perhaps uh, the uh, more agriculture uh, uh, based uh, uh, area. Um, <clears throat> so I, I uh, co completely uh, support that effort. Um, I, I just want to say that uh, the challenge is uh, is that the uh, analysis is uh, only as good as the available data, um, and there is a a couple of our challenges uh, here. Um, well, one is uh, certainly, you know, um, and and uh, my um, uh, colleague um, Adi, you know, um, did his best. You know, I'm finding the data, uh, but certainly um, we have not been able to uh, identify or find the variables that we need, you know, to uh, do a more robust. Um, causal analysis, okay? Um, so what I said previously, uh, when I, uh, when I uh, show um, some of the preliminary regression estimation results, um, we were not able to, and maybe we will not be able to make a causal infer inferences if we don't have you know, um, additional control variables. Uh, so maybe this is a more um, a request, you know, to uh, the, uh, uh, BPS uh, to uh, the um, uh, Board of uh, Indonesian Statistics uh, more than to BAPNAS, uh, but it, it's all connected, right? Um, you know, the, the quality of our analysis is only as good as uh, the available data. Um, and um, really looking forward, you know, um, to do a more comprehensive analysis, you know, when the data become becomes uh, available. And the, the other piece is that uh, we really don't have a very long time series. Um, right now, we, we have a total of uh, 98 cities. If we um, also consider uh, the, the five Jakarta Kota Madias, okay, Jakarta Selatan, Jakarta Utara, if we include them all, as well as uh, Kepulauan Seribu, we have you know, um, 90 point observations um, for one period. I'm sorry, 98 observations in one period. But um, if, if we pull back, right, um, we only have uh, 98 cities, you know, um, since I think uh, the year 2000. Um, that was after the introduction of uh, laws 22 and 25, um, Undang Undang Nomor 22 dan 25, you know, um, on decentralization. But uh, before that, uh, <coughs> You know, between 1990 and uh, and 2000, I think we have uh, about 73 cities, and even before that, before the 1990s, um, we have uh, about 50 cities. Um, you know, um, the Kota Madias, for example, did not become officially incorporated. You know, um, uh, the Undang Undang did not actually make them official until 1992. Uh, so you know, there is not really much that we can do about that. You know, um, 
it, it, you know, because there is just no data. The city just didn't exist. You know, um, uh, um, many of them uh, were officially recognized only after uh, Undang Undang number 22 and, and, and number 20. But certainly um, it poses a challenge, you know, um, for uh, uh, robust analysis, you know, um, in the kind that we would like to do, perhaps uh, using um, panel or longitudinal uh, data model. Uh, so that's uh, one, um, you know, not so much a feedback, but a request, um, you know, to um, make uh, data at the disaggregated city level, you know, uh, more available, you know, to uh, researchers like us. Um, <clears throat> For Professor uh, uh, Safruddin um, Karimi uh, made a very interesting point um, uh, about uh, the, uh, uh, the diminishing role of agriculture um, and how the shift from agriculture to other industries, perhaps into manufacturing and services actually led to um, an increase in poverty and uh, and, and inequality. So this is uh, um, based on my study on China. Uh, <clears throat> China didn't open up. Um, uh, you know, I mean, actually, uh, you know, um, legally disallow people, you know, to move uh, from where they were born, where they have uh, the identification card, the KTP, you know, to somewhere else, right? Um, that is uh, the, uh, the the notion of a hukou in in China. It was only when they when the Chinese government started to allow movement from rural to urban areas that the economy began to expand. It is uh, this fresh infusion of labor from rural areas, you know, to the city, that is a uh, one driving force. Okay. Um, that make the, the the Chinese economic miracle possible. Um, so I think that the point here is that, you know, um, and this is also the insight from the classic Harris Todaro model, right? Um, is that if you just look at inequality exposed after the migration, yeah, of course, you know, um, poverty and inequality increase when people move from uh, um, from rural to to uh, uh, urban areas, but we also need to consider, you know, um, the initial condition, uh, the setting ex ante, because without the opportunities, you know, to move to the urban areas, then uh, the uh, rural population would not have the opportunities, would not have access, you know, to better jobs and better life um, that are only big cities can offer. Okay, and um, I think we should not worry about the uh, diminishing size of the agriculture labor force, because uh, that is uh, different uh, from the uh, uh, diminishing size of agriculture output. Uh, <clears throat> and my favorite example is, is the US, okay? The contribution of agriculture to the US economy right now is only about 2%, only 2% of the American gross domestic product is accounted for by agriculture. Um, and you know, um, we, we have uh, some ways to go and we may not necessarily want to follow the American model, but the, the point is that we have to allow consolidation you know, um, among the smaller farmers to take place, right? We, we should allow uh, economies of scale, of scale you know, um, to, uh, to take advantage um, and produce more output than, and, and in so doing, right? Contribute to uh, a more secure food supply, okay? Um, and I, I think, um, uh, I, I'm not so worried about the, uh, uh, the, the movement, you know, um, of uh, the population uh, from rural to urban areas. Um, you know, um, and one strong argument is that we are a free country, right? We are not China. Um, so people should be free to go to wherever they want. You know, um, what we do need to do is uh, to make sure that the social infrastructure is there, right? Um, and I, I think um, um, I, I think uh, the, the Chinese government has done you know um, a very good job uh, in making sure that uh, when uh, rural uh, workers you know started to migrate you know to the, the Chinese cities, they actually provided you know um, a support like uh, 
um, health infrastructure, transportation, um, you know, um, and uh, social security support, uh, you know, um, for this uh, new migrant to the cities. And and I think um, there is a lot that we can learn, you know, from the Chinese experience. Okay, thank you, Dr. Yuri Mansuri, for the feedback. Okay, uh, now we are proceed to the uh, question and answer session. Maybe uh, just a few uh, uh, questions. Uh, we are have uh, maybe a question from the online who participating uh, from the Zoom meeting, and, and one question from the offline session. Okay, uh, Bangari can help me to. There is any question from the participant who online uh, meeting? Okay, uh, okay, Prof. Uh, Shafrizal, maybe you ask some question. Okay, okay it's okay. Okay, Pak Yuri, I really appreciate your studies about spatial pattern of urban population across Indonesian cities. Uh, as far as I know, maybe you also mentioned that, that the main problem of urban population in Indonesia is higher urbanization rate, higher urbanization rate. In 1970s to 80, most population live in rural area, but now, uh, more than half of the population already live in urban areas. What does it mean? That means urban economics become more important. Now, the interesting question here is that uh, with the higher urbanization rate, then what is the optimal city size should be? Yeah. We have to question that. Because if the city is too big, then there are a lot of problems coming. Maybe unemployment, maybe a traffic jam, very high price of land, poverty, and so on. But if the population, urban population, is too low, then the, the growth of the city is becoming also slower. So this is the problem. So it will be interesting, you also mentioned a little bit about the optimal city size. I suggested that you, we can make a study on the optimal city size for the case of Indonesia. In the past, I have made a small studies about the optimal economic measurement of the optimal city size, the case of West Sumatra. This is only small case yeah, for West Sumatra. By using uh, Alonso Richardson type of analysis, I think you know that. As a regional science people, I'm also from regional science, I think you know that. So we use that, and what is the interesting, but little bit different, Instead of using total population, I use the population density. The result is that uh, the optimal city size, not in the big cities, yeah, but mostly in the small cities, because the area is very uh, limited. Like in here in West Sumatra, uh, should be Padang will be close to the optimal city size. But in fact, no. Bukit Tinggi is the problem. Bukit Tinggi, because the size is very small. So, uh, just a small uh, suggestion. It will be interested if you make a study on the optimal city size for the whole city in Indonesia. Because I was not able to, to make that I only make a small study for the, the case of West Sumatra only. So it will be nice so that they, ca they have a police implication so about the urbanization. Whether we stood, for which city we should encourage the urbanization and for which city we should uh, 
stop or maybe discourage the urbanization in order to maintain the poverty, uh, unemployment, and traffic jam, and so on. Yes, usually we call it overpopulation. I think that's only a small comment for me. Uh, hopefully, next time you, uh, you can make that study that will be interesting. And also for the policy analysis or the partners, uh, how do you make the urbanization policy? whether we have to stop the urbanization or just open. For which city? Because different city is different optimality. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Prof. Safriza. Thank um, you, I would like uh, to receive a uh, feedback from you, Prof. Yori. It, it is, um, <coughs> the question of the optimal city size, um, <coughs> also came up in Professor Walter Eisert's 1956 book, Location Theory and Spatial Analysis. Um, and he um, asked that question after looking at the Ziff's law, you know, um, power curve. Because if American cities, one of the most developed countries in the world, are distributed you know, I'm um, that way, right? Is that meaningful to ask, you know, what the optimal city size is? Um, so um, I certainly, you know, um, would love to have the opportunity to work with you, uh, Safrizal, uh, on uh, the uh, question of optimal city size in, in, uh, uh, in Indonesia. My, 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 my feeling is that, um, this goes back to the conversation a few years ago in uh, growth uh, literature about um, the uh, distinction between unconditional convergence and conditional convergence. Um, and, and, and my feeling is that maybe there is no such, such thing as the uh, unconditional optimal city size. And instead, there is optimal city size that is uh, conditional, that is a dependent on a list of other variables, um, you know, um, the um, educational attainment of the, uh, of the workers, you know, and the, the, uh, uh, the initial density, uh, infrastructure, you know, um, government expenditure, uh, a number of our socioeconomic variables. Um, and um, my feeling is that to be able to say, what is the optimal city size? Maybe there is no one answer, but instead, maybe what we have is, you know, um, multiple, right? Uh, multiple optimal city sizes that are dependent on several initial conditions. Thank you for the, uh, the very uh, thoughtful um, question and feedback. Okay, thank you, Dr. Yuri. We have uh, two questions from the online uh, meeting. I will uh, read the question for you. The first question from Bambang Pujianto. Uh, currently in Indonesia is uh, still uh, in a state of middle income trap. In order to support Indonesian amass 2045, according to Bapenas 2017, Indonesia becomes one of developing countries, developed countries in the world the government policy, whether as democracy or dictator. Is it a very important? The question is what the policy needs to be issued by Indonesian government in address urban population and regional development, as well as economic growth in Indonesia. Okay, uh, the, another question from uh, Muhammad Abdu. Uh, he sent a question in Bahasa. Ada gambaran unik Kalau kita melihat uh, pertumbuhan uh, penduduk Indonesia, kita bisa membagi uh, dis, uh, distribusi penduduk menjadi tiga area. Yang pertama itu Jawa, populasinya yang tinggi, kemudian Sumatera yang menengah, lainnya adalah yang rendah. Bahkan populasi Jawa uh, di Bali, Jawa Bali mengalami peningkatan yang lebih cepat dalam uh, 20 tahun terakhir. Nah, uh, dari Muhammad Abduh minta uh, how your uh, comment about this uh, uh, conditions. We have a three a type of uh, level of uh, distribution of uh, population in Indonesia. Okay, okay thank you, Prof. Uh, we, meet, we need your uh, comments. 
I, I will start with the, la the last one here. Um, I, I would just say that uh, just based on the data that I shared in my presentation, that, that is uh, not the case. I, mean, I think that is um, conventional wisdom. You know, many people assume that the uh, fastest growing uh, cities are in, in Java and in Bali, but um, that, that is not uh, what the data tells us. Uh, uh, there is no simple relationship uh, between initial population size and subsequent population growth. Uh, you know, um, so th there's no simple, you know, um, linear model that we can estimate, you know, to establish a convergence here. Uh, because it, it seems like uh, the uh, uh, some of the middle cities, you know, um, maybe the one who are growing slowest, and then uh, some of the uh, smaller cities outside of uh, Java in the outer island were the ones who are growing fastest. Um, and then, uh, um, and, and then we have the largest uh, cities, including Jakarta, that are also growing, but not as fast as uh, some of the smaller cities in the outer island. Um, so again, you know, um, uh, there's no simple linear relationship here between initial population and and uh, uh, subsequent uh, population growth. I think um, we need a non-linear model, you know, to uh, make sense of the pattern of a relationship. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, to Bambang's uh, question. Uh, <clears throat> What policies need to be issued by the Indonesian government to address urban population and regional development, as well as uh, economic growth in Indonesia? This is the, the, the uh, million dollar question. I, I, I wish I, I have uh, um, no, a fixed answer to, uh, to, to this question. Um, <clears throat> but um, I, I think uh, we are in the, in the, in the right track you know, um, uh, right now. Um, uh, more work uh, need to be done. Um, <clears throat> And, and you know, um, uh, Professor Budi Reza Sudarmo is here. You know, um, he has written a very nice uh, paper, a series of papers actually, about a convergence uh, among Indonesian regions. But I, I would say this: um, I, that there is no, in, in my own study, there is there is just you know, um, no clear uh, uh, pattern of relationship, you know, um, between. Um, in, initial GDP per capita and subsequent growth. You know, the, the evidence according to uh, uh, this study that I published in Applied Economics is, is, is quite mixed. Um, and what, th what that means in terms of, uh, uh, you know, um, regional development policy is that uh, we, we should definitely do more, you know, uh, to promote um, economic development um, in, uh, in, in, um, in regions, you know, in particular, uh, the less developed uh, e economies outside of a Java. Um, I, I know the, the the notion of a moving uh, the capital city to Kalimantan is a is a highly political and controversial uh, controversial topic. Um, but I, I would say this: if, if the goal is uh, to promote uh, more balance regional development between Java and the outer island, you know, um, I think that maybe you know I'm not very cautiously. Say this. Uh, maybe that is a one way to do it. You know, um, there is a, a lot of things that we still need to do to ensure um, there's going to be a successful relocation program. Um, but it, we, we look at other places that have done a, a similar uh, a relocation of a capital city. You know, um, South Korea that I'm familiar with. You know, um, when they move some of the government offices to Sejong City, you know, um, have been uh, quite successful. Okay. Um, so um, I think um, that is uh, one instrument um, that we should take uh, into serious consideration. You know, um, if we really care about addressing regional inequality. Okay, thank you, Dr. Yuri. Uh, <clears throat> uh, because of the limited of time, we end the question and answer session. Uh, finally, we come to the uh, the end of part of our lecture. We are. Uh, thanks again to our uh, presenter, Dr. Yuri Mansuri, our discussion, Professor Safrudin Karime and Dr. Mia, and our participant online and offline. I would like to say thank you for your attention. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Bu Adela.
Thank you very much, Bu Adila, as a moderator, and also our uh, discussants, Professor Shafrudin Karimi and Ibu Mia. Thank you very much, Ibu and Bapa, and also um, our speakers today. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you also um, for the participant from the uh, discussion that really uh, bring uh, the idea and also uh, we bring something to um, what we call it develop regional development in Indonesia itself. Before we close, we would like to invite Dr. Enrizal Redwan to deliver a closing statement for today's event. Silakan, Bapak. Thank you very much, Indah. Uh, peace be upon you all. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Pak Budi uh, here, Pak Safrizal, uh, Ibu Mia, uh, Ibu keluarga Pak Hendra, uh, and uh, Mr. Dean, yeah, uh, Director of uh, LPR. Institute of Regional Economic Studies, yeah. and uh, all our special guests of online uh, and offline here. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Yuri already delivered a uh, very uh, interesting topics that expand our understanding in economic uh, outcome by uh, taking into account the complexity in, in economy. And uh, hope these uh, quite new topics will encourage young economists here to conduct research on this particular topic. Now, uh, uh, Professor Hendra Ismara already started with uh, regional income inequality or income disparities. And now is our time to proceed forward by taking into account this complexity into that uh, regional disparities uh, topics. So uh, last night, you know, Pak Budi said that our uh, duty actually yeah, to continue um, what Professor Hendra Esmara uh, already given us, yeah, uh, the uh, Know, initial study to uh, be developed here in uh, Andalas University. So in that case, um, I again, on behalf of uh, Faculty of Economics and Business and the uh, Institute of uh, Regional Economic Studies, I thank you very much and also for all organizers. Uh, again, uh, this very, uh, we are very appreciated with um, you are at work. Um, that's all I can say. Bilahi uh, taufiq wa hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih, Pak En. Thank you very much, Pak En Rizal. And uh, there is a one last. Um, we would like to invite Dr. Mia. So, Pak Dekan, uh, allow us to. We're gonna give a kind of the gift and souvenir to Dr. Mia this afternoon. Ya, terima kasih Pak Dekan dan Ibu Mia, dipersilakan kembali ke tempat. Bapak dan Ibu, now we are arrived at the last and uh, at the end of our event today. We would like to say thank you very much to uh, Dean of Faculty of Economic and Business, Pak Efa and also Vice Dean. And we also would like to think, uh, say thank you to Professor Yuri Mansuri and Pak Budi. Terima kasih Bapak. And we would like to also thank you very much to keluarga besar. Uh, Bapak Almarhum Hendra Esmara, terima kasih Bapak Ibu dan juga keluarga besar. Kemudian kami juga mengucapkan terima kasih kepada Prof. Syafrudin Karimi. Terima kasih Prof. dan Ibu Mia Amalia dari Bapenas. And 
Um, we would like to also thank you very much to Professor Arif Ansor Yusuf that has been open this event today. Dan tentunya juga kepada tamu undangan dari Bank Indonesia dengan uh, dari OJK dan juga Bapak Ibu dari Bapak Nas, kami ucapkan terima kasih. Semoga uh, inaugural Hendra S. Malo Lecture on Regional Development ini menjadi awalan diskusi Regional Development ke depannya, khususnya di Indonesia. Terima kasih kepada Ibu Yulianas juga, terima kasih Ibu atas kedatangannya. Baiklah Bapak dan Ibu, uh, saya Indah Permata Surani mohon undur diri, mengucapkan terima kasih atas partisipasi Bapak dan Ibu semuanya. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Terima kasih Pak Yuri. Terima kasih Pak Yuri. Terima kasih Pak. Ya, Ibu Lydia, mudah-mudahan kita jumpa lagi. Salam Untuk... sehat. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ya. Waalaikumsalam. Untuk Bapak Ibu yang berada di ruang seminar, kami persilahkan juga untuk